chat to, to field questions. You know, so if people have questions, they can they can type Q or you know something like that in there, and then uh, you know I'll make sure that he's unmuted and, and one by one we can get around to uh, getting to your questions and whatnot. And I I think the way that I plan to structure this is just starting by going through the the basics of everything and then getting into whatever nitty gritty stuff you guys have questions about, whether it be single bevel stuff or double bevel or thinning or whatever. I got nothing else going on since we can't really do so much work right now. So, you know, my, my time is yours today. Um, we have, I want to say about like 70, 75 people uh, that are going to be logging into this today. Plus, uh, because we're going to be streaming on YouTube, or actually we are currently streaming on YouTube, uh, I imagine there's going to be a, a number of other people. I am worried about the possibility of us maxing out the, the group. We're allowed up to 100 people with, uh, with Zoom. I paid for like a little membership for this stuff, but I didn't think that we'd hit that high of a number, to be honest. I thought it'd be like, you know, 30, 40, 50 people. Uh, and then this morning I got to work and there's just like emails. Hey, I want to join in. So I, I that's cool. Can't, can't complain too much about uh, people's desire to participate in stuff like this. All right. Perks uh, of having so many people at home. What's that? It's the perks of having so many people working from home or at home off Man, work. Yeah. It's uh, it's nuts. Yeah, I wonder how it's going to change things also in terms of, um, you know, moving forward. Do people continue to work at home and people have fewer offices? Uh, it, it seems kind of unnecessary for a lot of people to have offices when they're functionally effective at, at working at home. I, I really do wonder how that changes things. I'm going to see if I can turn off this waiting room and just have people be able to join now. I believe that I've done that. And then I think it mutes everyone on entry. You guys should be able to unmute yourselves if you have questions. And honestly, I don't have a problem with it. I just worry that as we become a much bigger class and people try to talk over each other, uh, it could get a little confusing. So I think the idea is that as much as possible, uh, we'll try and keep people on mute and, and go from there. So we have, what, about 15 minutes uh, until we get everything started. Um, I guess while we're waiting, if you guys do have questions that you want to ask, I'd be happy to answer them for the time being. Um, and then as, as we get rolling with stuff, we'll see how it all goes. So does anyone have any questions about anything before we get started? You're well, more than welcome actually, to unmute yourselves. Yes. Yeah, I actually have an unrelated question. What, um, I, so I guess with COVID, has the Reddit, like where you guys were going to make knives for Reddit, has that, yeah. has that been put on hold? Well, uh, I haven't really talked to them about it um, for, for a little bit since I haven't been doing anything. I imagine there has to be at least some delay. Um, I don't know how significant that delay is going to be, but for instance, because we had to shut down for a little bit, I had to ask a lot of my vendors to hold off on shipping stuff until May. Uh, you know, So that, that has an effect on things. We are continuing to place orders during this time. So the idea is that if if all else fails, at least we can start to have things rolling in so that we're prepared uh, when we are able to open back up. But I haven't talked to, to Matt or anyone else from the, the Reddit group about this yet, uh, since I think we're all just trying to get an understanding of what the hell's going on first before we jump to any conclusions about anything. Uh, but I, I, I still intend to do it if they want me to. But yeah. That sounds awesome. Thanks. Yeah. Did some of the, the engravings that people want, though, the, like... I, I wish people thought about the fact that everything that they type, I have to translate and talk to a, a like traditional Japanese craftsman about. And some of them are like a little bit more easygoing than others. But just like, just imagine trying to talk to your grandpa about trying to put like a, a penis or like something relating to a dick on a knife. Uh, <laughs> or, or just even like, even some of the crazy sayings that people have. Uh, I mean, it's just, it, it cracks me up. Uh, someone has something to say about Reddit in the chat. Uh, oh, and uh, <laughs> yeah, no, I mean, I think it's all, it's all fun. Honestly, just, you know, between you and me and the God knows how many people will be watching this, we got our laser cutter over here. I'm pretty sure the first things that we engraved on it were wildly inappropriate. So I, I feel like that's just a natural kind of way that people gravitate uh, in situations like this. But I got to talk to people about that shit. Like, you know, someone says like, hey, I want to put, I studied the way of the ninja on there. Like, it sounds ridiculous. 
I can't go and talk to like a, a craftsman that takes his job really seriously and be like, by the way, guys, let's just put jokes all over this shit. You know, it would be a great knife and we'll just put some like Chappelle one liners on there and call it a day. <laughs> yeah. I do like where, where people went directionally with the knives though. I, it looks like we're shaping up to do the uh, Raku Kiritsuke shaped Waguto, uh, which is pretty thin and, and nice and relatively tough and durable. And I think that would be a lot of fun. And then there's a decent amount of demand for the Gangetsu. Um, not the way that I would get started for most people, but uh, it's a great knife. Uh, so, you know, hopefully as, as that group thing kind of comes together, we make sure that people understand what it is that they're getting and, uh, yeah. All right. Uh, Ryan Vesper, you are here. What's up? Can you hear me? What's going on? Um, so Ryan is going to be helping me out with a lot of this kind of stuff. And, uh, I was asking him if he could keep an eye on the chat. Uh, so if you guys have questions in the meantime, I've tried to mute everyone as they join the group. You're welcome to unmute yourself. I just really want to keep it as controlled and organized as possible. So if you have questions in the chat area, just type in like a cue or, or something like that. Hey, I have a question. And uh, Ryan's going to be checking in on that stuff and trying to field those questions and make sure that I pay attention to them. Uh, he also can probably answer a lot of questions. Uh, Ryan, up until this ridiculousness happened, uh, was the culinary director for a restaurant group downtown that has a really, really awesome uh, Italian restaurant focused on, I guess, like Bolognese food. Yeah, Northern yeah. Italian Bolognese. Yeah. And then they have a pizza shop too, Rosso Blue yeah. and Super Fine. Uh, Steve Sampson, his wife Dina are the owners there. I, they're lovely, awesome people. Uh, and I hope they're doing well through all this. But unfortunately, Brian has a little bit of free time on his hands now. Yeah. Uh, so <laughs> So uh, we're using it wisely and trying to help out people. Honestly, this, this whole thing happened as a function of Ryan and uh, Ted Hobson, who's another chef here in LA. Uh, I, the two of them have been talking about doing like a sharpening class. And then I totally butted into that shit and was like, hey, I'll do one. Well, it's perfect. <laughs> I definitely can't yeah. answer the questions you can. Well, if you guys have questions about food, cooking, stuff like that, I imagine we're going to have a pretty awesome group of people here just based on uh, who I saw uh, asking to sign up for this kind of stuff. Uh, we have we have a lot of chefs, a lot of cooks. Um, so it's nice that we can all get together like this. What's up, Guido? How's it going? How are you doing, brother? Very good, man. Are uh, you staying safe through all this? Ah, pretty much. I mean, what else can I do? <laughs> you still in Texas right now? Where are you at? No, I'm in, I'm in Miami now. I went back home. Cool. Nice, man. Uh, how, how are things going out there? I have a few friends who just moved out there recently. Uh, literally, like, a month before this shit started, they moved out there to open a restaurant, and then this. So. Which one? Uh, fuck, I don't remember the name. Uh, it's my friends Jay and Amber. She used to be a pastry chef for, like, Craftsman and Wolves and worked at Publican. He also used to work at Publican. And it's this, like, fashion brand. I want to say in South Beach uh that has like a little complex and they're opening up a restaurant concept with it they they're amazingly talented she especially is an amazing talented pastry chef uh just really nice people uh and they literally just moved out there for this uh, Shit. So I, I, yeah i hope that like when this calms down we can all go back to some semblance of normal but you know <laughs> yeah. who, who knows at this point i guess we just gotta wait out and see pretty much uh, so we're still about 10 minutes out uh, from starting, yep. I see that there's a number of things in the chat. I haven't looked at them. Yeah. Let me just walk I back over there. Explode. So I could, I could prompt, prompt them for you, John. So yeah, do you want to do that? Are, I already know you have your opinion on this first one, uh, but maybe you can explain to them why pros cons on stropping on leather uh, over stones. I know that John doesn't necessarily love like stropping on also wood and leather. I think he just likes. Yeah, you know, there's there's nothing wrong with it. Uh, yeah. it's, it's not like a bad thing. And certainly stropping in general uh, makes your edge sharper. Uh, yeah. It absolutely does. Um, in terms of doing it on stones versus uh, balsa or leather or something like that, I mean, I guess it really depends on the, the result that you're looking for. In general, softer surfaces like balsa or leather have a little bit more give. Um, so it's possible to convex edges or round things over a little bit more. But my, my biggest issue with dropping is that people tend to use it to cover up poor sharpening uh so they're, they're fixing mistakes with that 
Uh, and also you lose a lot of tactile feedback from your edge. You lose a lot of bite uh, to your edge from that. So when you're cutting thick skin things like tomatoes, bell peppers, um, I don't know, eggplant, stuff like that, you don't have the same kind of bite uh, along your edge. And so I've, I've always stuck with stropping on whatever my finishing stone might be. So like if I finish at a 6,000 grit, I'll use that to, to strop my knife. Uh, I do that because it's going to leave me a slightly toothier edge, especially relative to something like a one micron or half micron uh, diamond or CBN spray on leather, you know, the kinds of things that a lot of people are using when they strop. Uh, but also that it has some abrasive in it. Uh, and so it starts to cut steel. So if I use that uh, same stropping mode to, to touch up, it's a little bit more aggressive and helps me touch up a little bit more quickly. Um, so yeah, I, I, I think my main dislike of stropping is a function of covering up for sharpening. Uh, but secondary to that would be the loss of bite along the edge. And so if you can strop on a lower grit finishing stone, three, four, five, six, even even 8,000 grit, uh, you end up with a little bit more bite. And I, I feel like that works better in kitchens, at least based on my experience in, in cooking. But I'm, I think a lot of people would agree that when you have some kind of bite, uh, tactile feedback to your edge, it makes sense. That's definitely true. Does anyone have any like anything additional to, to throw in there about it? Again, you're welcome to unmute yourselves if you want to chime in. I just want to try and keep it as controlled as possible. That's good. I haven't thought about it that way, but it is true because I've definitely noticed like, you know, sometimes you stop and give this like lightsaber, super sharp edge, but it doesn't have the tooth necessarily as much as it can if you're just finishing on a you know, yeah, and it's and it's nice for some things, right? Like when you're when you're plating stuff raw, you know, if you're putting raw fish on a plate or a raw vegetable on a plate, you want that really smooth, glossy surface that looks shiny and doesn't oxidize quickly. Uh, and you can get that even with a slightly toothier edge. But I, I can see, you know, in some situations, just for the bulk of what we end up using our knives for, a slightly toothier edge tends to to work better. And especially with response to the, or with respect to the tactile feedback that you get from it, you can feel what's going on. I think that's important for people to develop knife skills in the same way that we're constantly tasting our food or touching shit when we're cooking it, just to make sure it's the, the way that we want it to be. I mean, you, you should get feedback from, from your cuts uh, to make sure that they are the way that you want them to be as well. Good. What about cool. um, people who have questions about like pressure uh, during sharpening, like, on thousand grit yeah. stones versus finer stones in terms of pounds of pressure. And I think someone also followed up with, uh, yeah, I think, uh, you know, sometimes when they put the pressure, they get valleys after a single use and all that on their blades. Yeah. So, man, you don't really have to use a lot of pressure. And I don't, I don't want to say that the way that I sharpen is the only way people should be sharpening. There are a lot of different ways that, that are effective. You know, there's dudes like, like Bob Kramer, who, uh, I respect. I think he's a great knife maker. Uh, by all accounts, a, a very nice guy. He uses a lot of pressure. I I tend to not use that much pressure. Uh, there are there are scenarios where I would use higher pressure, but in general, just for the sake of keeping this as simple as possible, if you guys have kitchen scales, let me go grab one really quick. I know I have one around here somewhere. Um, I think it's just a good exercise in the sense that everyone has a kitchen scale available to them in the kitchens they work in for the most part. Where the hell did I put mine? Aha. All right. So uh, if you have a kitchen scale, uh, you can do this kind of test for yourself at, at home. Um, whatever hand you're going to be applying pressure with, that's the hand you want to you want to check your pressure on. Uh, so I've had this zeroed out now. And I'm going to apply pressure, in my case, with my left hand. Since I'm usually sharpening uh, as a right-handed sharpener, I'll be holding the knife in my right hand like this. So my left hand would be the one applying pressure. So with my left hand, I'm going to apply pressure to the scale. And my experience is that on the heavier side of my pressure, I'm somewhere in like the, I don't know, 1500 gram range, plus or minus a little bit. You don't have to be so exact with this kind of stuff. It just gives you a rough idea of about how much pressure one might be applying. Uh, so that's my heavier pressure. Most of my sharpening, I would say, takes place at like a medium pressure. Uh, and that's kind of in like the 500 to 700 gram range of things. And, uh, and when I'm doing some finishing, like stropping, things like that, I'm closer to 100, uh, sometimes even lower than that. Really, I just want to make sure that I have enough pressure to keep the knife in contact with the stone uh, and that I'm not bearing down on it. When people bear down on their sharpening, when you apply a lot of pressure, uh, it makes angle consistency a little bit more difficult. There's a lot more wobble. Uh, you do tend to dish your stones a little more quickly as your stones get thinner. There's a chance of them cracking. Um, yeah, you don't you don't have to power through it. It's about 
consistency and finesse and, and repeating the exact same thing over and over again, more than it is strength uh, or pressure. So hopefully that answers that. All right, what else you got, Ryan? Uh, someone brought up a good point uh, before the questions. If like, uh, if you have a question, try to do it in the chat or, you know, if you, you can raise your hand or whatever, but if you're not on mute, every time you even like put down a plate and anything makes noise, it switches the screen to that person. And then uh, we don't get to see what John's doing. So if everyone get oh, like, I thought that I had you. pinned my video up. Is that not the case? Yeah, but what happens is when people are off mute, if they make noise, it takes them and puts them to the main video. And so uh, let me see if I can adjust that in the settings that. really quick. That's Give the least second. experience I'm having. Let me be back yeah. in a second. I know that I have pinned my video, but let's see what we can do. Yeah, okay, cool. to to pin time, pin advance. No, too. What's that? I had to pin your video on mine. Oh, okay. Um, spotlight video? Okay, I think now that I have it spotlighted for everyone. So everyone should just see me. Is that correct? Let's see. Uh, that work? Yeah, someone make some noise really quick and let's see if it switches away. Anyone just unmute yourselves for a second. Anything? Make some noise. No, it's still there. Perfect. It stays on me. Woo. Hello. All right. Hello. All right, cool. So uh, yeah, like, like Ryan said, I think our goal is to make sure that we keep everyone muted for the time being. Um, and if you have questions, we have the little chat thing. Uh, yeah. Ryan's gonna be helping me out with all this stuff. Let's yeah. that a little also, bit. there's no way we're gonna be able to get to all the questions. I have a feeling that like with 50 people, there's gonna be a ton. So if we don't get to it- Ryan, there's like, way more than 50 people, by the way. We're up yeah. to like 75 that I sent out invites to. Perfect. And I'm also live streaming on YouTube. Uh, oh, great. So that so hopefully this is recorded people, and people have access to really hit every question. So if we don't miss it or skip by it, you can just send it, put it in an email to John or to myself. Yeah, certainly. And later. Yeah. And, and if we don't get to you, like if you type something up and we just missed it for some reason, you can type it back in again later, but just keep in mind that a lot of people have questions. When we first got this started, uh, what I was saying uh, to everyone was that my goal is to first go over just the, the basics of, of sharpening. I wanna go over the fundamentals of what we're gonna be doing in sharpening and teach it like I would to anyone that's just getting started. And then we can roll into kind of more complex, uh, I guess, aspects of, of sharpening and, and then especially get to, to all of your questions. So it looks like we have just about 40 people on right now uh, and it's almost noon. So I, I say we get rolling. Maybe we'll do like one or two more questions just to give a few more people a chance to, to join in uh, and then go from there. Sound good? A uh, couple questions that we didn't get to already. Uh, Jason was asking about, uh, he's getting stuttering on his uh, single bevel knife when he's sharpening it. I think it's his What do you mean stuttering? Jason, can you unmute yourself for a second? I'm just curious what you mean by, by stuttering. Is it like skipping over the stone or? What's what's going on with it? Do you need help unmuting, or are you just typing? Let's see. Uh, do, 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 him. Yeah, no. Uh, he sorry. might he might be typing. Yeah, I'm just not. I'm not 100 percent sure what exactly uh, you mean by that, Jason. Do you need help unmuting? Just wave your hand if you do. Help unmuting. Okay, I got you. Give me a second, Jason. Where are you at on this list? All right, talk talk to me, man. What's up? Can you hear me? Yeah. All right. Uh, so, like, I'm trying to sharpen like a dev, and basically running into the issue where I'm putting pressure on it, and as mm -hmm. I'm moving the knife forward, it's like literally stuttering or like rumble strips kind of feeling. Too hmm. high angle. Is uh, Sorry, uh, how how high of pressure would you say you're using? Are you using heavy pressure or really light pressure? Or, or? Uh, heavier than what you 100 grams that you mentioned. Well, 100 um, grams is my lightest pressure. Uh, okay. So what I was saying earlier was, when I'm applying heavier pressure, it's around like I don't know 1500 grams or so. Uh, the bulk of my sharpening is maybe somewhere between like 500 to 700 grams, uh, and then just the finishing that I'm doing is on the the lighter side of stuff. Um, you know, so if, if I could see yeah, stuttering in, in two cases, if yeah, stuttering could be a function of just <laughs> like really bearing down on stuff and, and skipping that way. It could also be really just being too light and not having enough pressure to keep the stone and knife in contact. Um, 
your stone might also not be flat. You might not be using enough water. What, what kind of stone is it? Uh, your 600. Uh, 600. So I've tried using that because it seems like if I get a good slurry going, it helps to not stutter. So I'm wondering That's a, like you mentioned. Is that the no-soak splash and go one or is that the resonoid based one? Uh, which one do you have the extra large of? Uh, that's the resonoid based one. This one. Okay, cool. So the resonoid based one, do you soak that stone or do you just uh, use it as a splash and go stone? I think you do say on the description, like soak it for four minutes or I forget exactly what it is. But I okay. So uh, resonoid based stones, th there are three main kinds of sharpening stones that are out there. There are ceramic stones or like vitrified sintered things, uh, resonoid based stones and magnesia based stones. And they all operate a little bit differently. And this is going to make a big difference for you, especially because once you learn how to use that stone, it's going to change your experience with it. Ceramic stones are porous, so like the, the king stone, our 1,000, 6,000 combo stone. A, a lot of stones that just immediately soak in water uh, tend to be ceramic stones. Ceramic stones require soaking before you use them. Uh, doesn't matter how long you soak them for. You just need to soak them until the bubbles stop coming out. Once it's fully saturated, it's good to go. You can leave them in water, take them out, put them in an oven to dry them. It doesn't like nothing can go wrong with them. They're like bricks. All right, uh, so those are ceramic based stones that require soaking um, and you need to splash water on them continually. Resonoid based stones are often referred to as splash and go stones, but it's kind of a misnomer because they really work best when they are permanently soaked. Um, resonoid based stones are less porous. And so initially as you splash water on it, you'll notice that you can sharpen on it immediately, uh, but it does soak in a little bit of water. Uh, when you permanently soak resonoid based stones, the binding agent softens. And what happens is the binding agent softens is it releases more fresh abrasive more quickly, provides better tactile feedback, holds water better, both in the stone and on the surface. Uh, and so the stones work best. They work the best that way when you can permanently soak them. Where it sucks is that when you soak them and then dry them, that process uh, causes them to crack. So you want to leave them permanently soaked. Uh, or if you do dry them out, you want to wrap them in a damp towel or, or something like that. You want to slow down the drying process as much as possible. What's happening is that because they're not porous, the outside evaporates more quickly than the inside. And as it evaporates, those uh, the, the binding agent that's uh, swelled up with water uh, starts to contract as it loses that water mass. And as it contracts, it contracts around the center of the stone that hasn't yet lost that water mass. Uh, and it causes stress fractures to form. So if you can let it come to more of an equilibrium and dry it slowly, you can mitigate that a little bit, but it's it's really best if you can uh, to leave them permanently soaking. And then magnesia based stones, that would be like the Naniwa Chosera professional series, or we have like a no soak 320, 600, 1500, 3000, uh, the Shapton Pro series. Uh, those ones, the binding agent leaches out when you soak it in water for an extended period of time. So in those cases, it doesn't soak in any water. All you have to do is splash water on the surface. So for example, like this is a magnesia based stone. All I have to do is that. No water gets soaked in. I don't have to worry about it. It's ready to use right now. But with the resonoid based stones, uh, I wanna soak them, not just until the bubbles stop coming out, but like for hours, a few hours, maybe uh, at, least, at least 15, 20 minutes before I start using them for them to really hit the stride that I like. When you soak them, they're so much more muddy and creamy and fast cutting, they, they feel great. So I would try that with the 600. I'd try permanently soaking it. Uh, and I would try a little bit of pressure control. Um, the last thing that could potentially have gone wrong is just angle inconsistency. Uh, if you're applying a lot of like shinogi pressure or a lot of edge pressure, maybe overdoing that a little bit uh, and just causing it to skip a little bit that way. Uh, so give those things a shot and let me know how it goes. Sound good? Thank you. All right, uh, 12.05, 44 people in. I don't know, let's get rolling with some some basic sharpening stuff and then we'll get back to the questions. So yeah, we got uh, to roll through the questions at the end too. If whoever wants to stay as long, I can go through and anything we haven't hit, we could just Q yeah. and A. Cool. Yeah, I have again all, all day dedicated to this. Hopefully I don't take up all of your day with this yeah. stuff, but uh, you know, I I got time. So all right. So our, our goal just for the people that have uh, recently joined is that we're gonna keep everyone on mute as much as possible. If you have questions, go ahead and post either the question or just uh, say that you have a question in the chat. Uh, Ryan Vesper is helping me out with this. Uh, he's gonna be checking those out and fielding them for me. Um, and then I'm gonna go through just like the basics of sharpening first, uh, and then we'll get into more complex issues and uh, periodically we'll make sure that we touch on questions that are pertinent to what it is that we're doing at that time. So I guess without further ado, let's get this rolling. Oh, by the way, we're all live on YouTube too. So uh, mm -hmm. now you know. Um, all right, guys. 
uh, basic sharpening. Let me go grab a couple of sheets of paper that I normally like to go over with this because I think they're useful. I'll be right back. Give me one second. All right. Hmm. All right. Okay. So when it when it comes to sharpening. Uh, the, the way that I like to teach it is that I like to go over first fundamental concepts. What do you need to know? The, the really basic stuff you need to know. Then I want to demonstrate all that stuff to you so you can see how it plays out. Uh, and then I'll show you what mistakes look like, uh, how, how to recognize them and, and what to do about them. And I feel like that does a pretty good job of helping people develop enough of an understanding to be able to do this stuff on their own. So first thing, when, when we are getting started sharpening, we're usually getting started sharpening when our edge is no longer coming to like a clean apex. And whether that's because it has a little bit of damage uh, chipping or the edge has rolled over to the side, or it's just been blunted from, from constant contact with your cutting board, something like that. That's generally the time that we're gonna get started in sharpening. And the first thing that we wanna do in sharpening is form a burr that's even and consistent from the heel to tip on one side of our knife. So for those of you who aren't familiar with what a burr is, Metal likes to stay connected to itself. Uh, and so for the same reasons that we get things like aluminum foil, uh, as we sharpen, say I'm sharpening on this side. As we sharpen on this side, a little bit of metal is gonna go away uh, and a little bit of metal is going to stay connected. And it's gonna flip over to the opposite side. It's gonna draw out like a little piece of aluminum foil, flip over to the opposite side. And this little bit that we're talking about here is called a burr. It's not necessary to form a burr when you're sharpening, but it's extremely helpful. And it's helpful because it provides for you feedback that, that it tells you whether you're doing things correctly or not. Uh, so when you form a burr, first, it tells you that you're actually sharpening the edge of your knife, not some area behind it. So you know that you're actually going to be effectively getting your knife sharp. Second, it tells you that you're removing fatigue metal from the edge. So all day as you're banging your knife against stuff, the metal gets worn down. Um, not too dissimilar from what happens to a paperclip when you bend it back and forth a bunch. Eventually, it just doesn't want to hold up anymore. And so it's important that we get rid of all the fatigue metal and expose fresh new metal uh, that will take the kind of edge that we want and uh, hold it for some reasonable period of time. The last thing is making sure that the burr is the same size all the way through from the heel to the tip of your knife. Uh, the reason that we wanna do that is we wanna make sure that we're removing the same amount of metal in each place along the blade. So if anyone's ever been in a professional kitchen, you've seen someone with like the tip of a knife that looks like a bird's beak or the heel sticks out like a talon or swings up all kinds of wonky profiles, a lot of that is a function of inconsistent or uneven burr removal. So if you form a large burr in one area and a small burr in another area, you're removing more metal in one area than the other and the shape of your knife is gonna change over time. So using the burr to tell you that you're removing the same amount of metal at each place uh, along the blade over time should help you maintain a consistent profile as, as you go about sharpening. So that's, that's why it's helpful to have a burr form. So uh, first we sharpen on one side of our knife, we form a burr that's even and consistent from heel to tip. And I'll go over how to feel for that uh, in just a little bit. All right, one time on, on the first side. On the second side, we do the exact same thing. The burr will only exist on one side at any given time. It can't exist on both, so it will be on one or the other. So for instance, I'm right-handed, so I tend to start sharpening on the right side of my knife. And as I sharpen, I form a burr. It forms on the opposite side that I was sharpening on, the, the left side. So I can feel for that as I do this. And then I flip over and do the other side of the knife, uh, forming a burr, even and consistent from heel to tip. So that, that's what we're trying to do at the, the base level of our sharpening. Uh, and we'll do that through our progression of stones. In a perfect world, in a complete sharpening setup, there are five things that you want in your sharpening setup. You want a coarse stone, usually something under like 800 grit or so. Uh, a lot of times we use things in the 220 to like 400, 500, 600 grit range. Uh, the idea behind a core stone is that it's there for major repairs, big chips, nicks, when your knife is super dull, when you need to get work done, uh, but it removes metal really quickly. So every mistake that you make shows up much more quickly and in a much more severe manner. So if you're not comfortable with sharpening, maybe it's good to hold off on that for a little bit. Uh, so that's core stone. Medium grit stones, usually between 800 and uh, 2000 grit. Those are like your uh, daily daily stones. Anytime your knife is a little bit dull, when there's minor chips or nicks, uh, when you want an edge that's functional for anything you want to do in a kitchen, you just have one stone, it's likely going to be a medium grit stone. So if you just had one stone, that's, that's your guy. 
Um, but because they're a little bit more aggressive, they, they make the process of burr removal a little bit trickier than it needs to be because they're more apt to form a new burr than they are to help you remove a burr that's already on there. So uh, that brings me to the last type of stone that is helpful, which is a finishing stone. That's usually something above 3,000 grit, could be 3,000, 6,000, 8,000. The higher you go, the smaller the abrasive size is, the less bite your edge is gonna have. So if you do like butchery, I'm thinking about that because I see Lucas in front of me. Uh, if you do butchery, uh, sometimes it's helpful to have a little bit toothier kind of edge where you can feel what's going on uh, and, and get through things with a little bit more tactile feedback versus if you're working with like predominantly raw fish or vegetables, it might be helpful to have a, a slightly finer edge. Uh, the finishing stone provides a few main benefits. One, uh, you get a more refined edge. So your cut feels smoother. Uh, you cause less damage to the foods you're cutting. So if you have like a lot of green herbs on your station, uh, you know, basil, parsley, things like that, they stay green longer with a keener edge like that than they would if you had a toothier edge where things start to oxidize a little bit more quickly. Uh, so that's helpful. The other thing that's helpful about finishing stones, they make the process of burr removal a little bit easier. So as we go through our sharpening, uh, we're going to go through our entire stone progression, coarse, medium, fine, uh, forming a burr on one side, other side, and then going through, making that burr smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller each step along the way, and also refining the scratch pattern. So when we use our coarse stone, it will scratch the blade in some way. On our medium grit stone, we want to make sure we get rid of the scratches from the coarse stone and replace them with the scratches from the medium grit stone. And the same thing as we move to our finishing stone. Um, because the finishing stones are less aggressive, as we go through the last part of our process, which is the reduction of the burr in both size and strength, and then eventually its removal, the finishing stones are a little bit easier to deal with because they're not as apt to form a new burr. So those are the three stones you need. There are two other things that you're gonna want in your five complete sharpening set of things. One, something to hold your stone in place. This shit is important. It's important because you don't want your stones sliding all over the place when you're sharpening. Now it can be, something totally free. It can be a damp towel on the corner of your countertop. And if you do so, you wanna make sure you're working off the countertop where like as a right-handed person, I work off the right corner of the uh, counter so that my right hand overhangs the floor so I have knuckle clearance. As a left-handed person, I work on the left-hand side. Uh, you can also buy fancy stone holders, uh, make your own. It doesn't really matter. The, the goal is that it stops the stone from sliding around and either positions you in a place where you have knuckle clearance or provides height so that you have knuckle clearance wherever it is that you're working. So. Core stone, medium grid stone, finishing stone, something to hold in place. And lastly, and very important, something to keep it flat. Over time, as you use your stone, it's gonna wear. And we don't use our stone surfaces perfectly for the most part, so it wears unevenly. And usually, uh, you can see here, usually there's like this kind of oval shape right here that wears a little bit more quickly, and it starts to look like a half pipe. In fact, I have a really fucked up stone over here that I can show you guys. So, uh, like this. You can see how this one is super, super messed up. Not flat at all. In fact, it's like every side of the stone uh, got a little bit messed up there. Uh, it's very tough to maintain consistent angles on things that aren't flat. And so over time, we want to flatten our stone. And there are, again, a number of ways you can do that from totally free to stupidly expensive and everything in between. You could walk outside and find a nice flat section of the sidewalk and dump some water on it and rub your stone on it. Uh, you could buy some wet dry sandpaper from the hardware store as coarse as you can get like uh, 120 grit, 80 grit, something like that, and lay it out with the grit facing up on a uh, hard flat surface and rub the stone on that. You might go through a few sheets. Uh, I like to use diamond flattening plates. I have a bunch of them over here. Uh, there's also large ceramic stone fixers like this kind of stuff. Uh, they're effective. They're just a little bit slower. It's, it is important to flatten your stones periodically. If you can get good at sharpening and start to use the surface of your stone a little bit more effectively, you can mitigate the how often you need to sharpen, but uh, you still got to do it. Uh, it's much easier to maintain a consistent angle on a flat surface than uh, on something that's not flat. And for certain kinds of sharpening, like on single bevel knives, wide bevels, it's much more important. So those are the five things you need in sharpening. Hey, John, we talked about for yes. Can you explain what the diamond flattening plates are a little bit? Some people have some questions about that. Yeah, sure. Uh, they're pretty straightforward. Usually it's like a metal or aluminum base, uh, and then it has diamonds electrically plated to one side of it. Uh, so uh, let me clean this one off really quick. This one also happens to have like diamond shaped uh, things cut into it. But can you see this? So yep. it's an aluminum base. And on this side, it has a bunch of diamond abrasive on it. There are other kinds of them, like this is another one, also has diamond on one side of it. 
what's nice about the diamond flattening plates like that, uh, here's another one, in fact, uh, what's nice about the diamond flattening plates is that they always stay flat. So unlike these kinds of flattening devices that also wear, the diamond ones always stay flat and they cut really quickly. So it's, it's a really fast process to flatten your stone. They don't last as long as these other options though. Uh, and so it tends to be a little bit more expensive to use and replace diamond stones, but they're convenient, fast, easy to deal with. Uh, and what we do with them, well, I'll show you as we go through our sharpening in, in a little bit. Does that answer kind of what people have been asking about, Ryan? Yeah, that's, I think that's perfect. And then cool. just one quick question that someone had before we get into a million more questions coming up, I'm sure as soon as you start sharpening is just quickly explain, some people don't know all the lingo, what you mean by saying toothy on your edge? Like when you're yes. talking about your cool. tooth. So um, when, when you sharpen, so like say I move my knife across the stone, this stone has abrasive in it. Uh, and because my motion is generally straightforward and straight back, the scratches that are created along the edge kind of follow that same direction. So I get all these diagonal scratches along the edge. And when you look at the edge under magnification, what you'll see is those scratches come all the way up to the edge. Uh, and those grooves that they create, create like microscopic teeth along the edge uh, in, in the same kind of shape and size of those abrasives. Uh, the bigger those teeth are, the more your knife starts to act like a serrated knife. The smaller those teeth are, the more your knife starts to act like a straight razor. Uh, and one would think that the smaller, the better overall. But what happens is when you cut certain things, you don't get tactile feedback when you're cutting. So like uh, everyone's cut a tomato, I imagine at some point, the skin's pretty thick. And when your knife doesn't have any kind of toothiness or, or bite to it, it tends to skid over the surface. And that can be a function of it either not being sharp or being really, really smooth as a sharp edge. Like the kind of edge you might wanna shave your face with doesn't work well for that kind of thing because it doesn't dig in or bite in uh, in, in the way that one might want. Uh, the other thing about that kind of uh, issue with microscopic teeth is they provide tactile feedback. So as you're cutting, you can feel what's going on. There's a little bit more responsive feedback uh, to the end user while you're cutting. And so that can be helpful, but you're always trying to find a range. How much damage can I cause relative to how much toothiness or feedback I'm looking for? Um, or how refined can I go without losing too much bite? Uh, my experience is that for most people in any kind of professional kitchen environment, whether that's a butcher or on garmo, pastry, whatever, the range tends to be somewhere between 1,000 grit and like 8,000 grit. Uh, 1,000 is, is pretty coarse, pretty toothy. If you just cut thick skin things all day and all you do is prep stuff out, uh, that might be helpful. Or if you do a lot of butchery, somewhere in that like one, two, 3,000 grit range works really well. For most line cooks, uh, you want to be somewhere in like the three to 6,000 grit range. Tends to be a, a good safe bet. It's not like the end all be all of answers, but it's just a good safe bet range to start from. Then you can use stuff and see for yourself what works well for you. As you start to get higher in the 8,000 or even 10,000, 12,000 grit range of things, you lose a lot of that bite, but if you work with a lot of raw ingredients, so like say you're doing uh, sushi or you do a lot of crudos on your menu, uh, or you're in pastry and you do a lot of like really clean raw fruit plated out there, maybe that kind of high grit finish leaves you a smoother, glossier look that, that is appealing to your customer or to your eye uh, that can be healthy, help, helpful. Cool. Uh, any other questions before we kind of continue on? You're good to go. All right, sweet. So, uh, We've gone through forming a burr on one side, forming a burr on the other side, uh, changing the scratch pattern from your coarse, medium, fine. So every, every grit that you move up, it's kind of like going up in sandpaper. You wanna make sure that you're erasing the previous grit and replacing it with the current grit each step of the way that you go. Uh, so we'll do coarse stone, one side, other side, medium grit stone, one side, other side, finishing stone, one side, other side. And then we'll go through a process of burr removal. And for me, burr removal is a, a two-part process. One, I wanna make sure that I further reduce the size of the burr and weaken its connection to the edge. Uh, and I tend to do that by stropping on my finishing stone. And so I'll show you more what stropping looks like in, in a little bit, but in general, I'm gonna be doing this kind of motion alternating sides. What I'm, what I'm doing on my finishing stone is bending the burr back and forth and back and forth a whole bunch uh, and also grinding away at it bit by bit. And I want to do that until I can't feel a burr anymore. It doesn't mean that it's gone. It just means that I can't feel it. And ideally that I've weakened its connection to the edge enough that when I do take it off, it doesn't cause damage. The last part of my process will actually be removing the burr. There are a number of ways to do it. I actually use the back of these blue non-scratch sponges. Uh, they're essentially just like extruded plastic. There's no abrasive in it. And so I just kind of swipe across it and it's coarse and aggressive enough to grab onto anything that might be connected to my edge. 
but it's not so aggressive as to cause damage to my edge. But I do still usually go back to my finishing stone and strop one, one or two times afterwards in case I caused any damage. You can also cut through hard felt, uh, cut through cork, uh, soft wood. Uh, just run your edge through that a couple of times until it starts to feel like smooth and easy to cut. Uh, say, those, those kinds of things are pretty effective for burr removal. There are many, many ways people go about it. But in general, the, the process should be uh, forming, forming the edge that you want, forming a burr, uh, reducing it in size and refining your edge, weakening the burr's connection to the edge and reducing it further in size and then removing it. That's the process that we'll be going through as we do our sharpening. So is everyone with me on that so far? Any questions pertaining to that? Nothing's come up. All right, sweet. Uh, so uh, what's the next thing I want to go over? The next thing I want to go over is going to be cross-sectional geometry. Uh, cross-sectional geometry refers to uh, how the, the blade tapers from the spine going towards the edge. So if you took this knife and say, just cut it here and then looked at it this way, you could see how it starts off thicker at the spine and then goes down uh, to a, a thinner edge overall. I'm gonna go grab a piece of paper and a marker because I think this will be better if I illustrate it. Give me one second. And a Sharpie. All right, Let's draw over here for a second. Okay, so can everyone see this cross section of a knife? So like this would be the spine up here, this is down at the edge. As we sharpen over time, let's do this with a slightly different color. We move into thicker sections of the blade. So, here you can see that even though we're sharpening roughly at the same angle, and bear with me, I'm a really shitty artist, the thickness behind the edge becomes thicker and thicker as we move up the blade. What's going on here is that as you sharpen your knife over time, you're removing metal from the edge and you're going up the blade, going up the blade into thicker sections of it. When your knife becomes thicker behind the edge, it changes the way that it interacts with foods. There's two things that you wanna think about when it comes to cutting performance. One is the edge. Uh, how acute of an angle have you put on there? How refined is it? So on and so forth. That tells you what happens when the cut begins, right? As soon as your knife comes into contact with something, how is it gonna feel? Does it feel really sharp? Does it feel really dull? How toothy is it? So on and so forth. But as soon as your knife starts to move through food, the rest of your knife, all the stuff behind the edge comes into contact with the food. And this is where cross-sectional geometry comes into play. The thicker your knife is, the more prone it is to wedging in tall, dense foods especially. Uh, so you'll find that it requires more force, more effort to cut through things. Your knife tends to get stuck. Foods crack at the bottom instead of the cuts completing nicely. Uh, the thinner it is, the less resistance, the less force required to cut things. Uh, so things move through more easily. Cuts tend to complete a little bit more easily. Thicker knives behind the edge tend to be much more tough and durable. So they resist chipping a little bit better. So if you want to, I don't know, like break down chickens cutting through the spine or uh, you're just gonna do like really rough stuff with your knife, uh, lobster, crab, things like that. Having something thicker cross section that can be helpful when you cut really delicate things like, uh, I don't know, what's, what's some delicate stuff people cut? Well, also root vegetables like uh, celery root, sweet potatoes, butternut squash. Uh, thinner knives tend to move through them with less resistance. So the, the knife doesn't wedge, the foods don't crack as much, but they can be damaged much more easily. Uh, and so the things that cause damage to your edge, there's three main things that cause damage to your edge. Hitting really hard things, bones, frozen food, seeds, nuts, stuff like that. Hitting things with excessive force, so like you know, really hard board contact as you're cutting stuff. Uh, for me, it was always onions. Every time I was julianning onions, you just get into this rhythm and it's like, pow, 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 pow. And then all of a sudden you realize like, holy shit, I messed up my edge. I might've slammed down the board a little bit too hard. So hard things, hard contact and lateral force against the edge. When you exert pressure against the edge in this direction, there's a lot of material behind it. It's very structurally stable. When you exert pressure against the edge in this direction, coming across the edge, uh, it's really thin at the edge. Uh, and because Japanese knives specifically tend to be a lot harder, instead of being prone to deformation or bending, they tend to chip. Uh, so when you have a really thin knife and you're cutting something thick, hard, tall, dense, like butternut squash, you wanna make sure that you're not twisting, rotating, moving from side to side or exerting pressure across the edge. Uh, the reason I bring up all this cross-sectional geometry is because if you aren't paying attention to it and you're just sharpening your knife over time, no matter what you do, your knife is gonna get thicker and thicker and thicker as you go. And as it gets thicker, it's gonna take more time to sharpen. It's not gonna feel as sharp. It's gonna require more effort as you move through foods. And so it's important that we regain control over how thick or thin our knife is behind the edge. So 
you can see that as we move up, it becomes thicker behind the edge. Thinning behind the edge is when we sharpen at a much more acute angle uh, than we initially did. So let's see if I can draw this without looking horrible. All right, so uh, you can see that my sharpening angle is much more acute. There's a lower angle than it, what, it, what it was when I was initially sharpening with these red lines over here. This allows me to regain control over cross-sectional geometry. So I can control how thick or thin my knife is behind the edge and dictate how I want it to perform. Do I want something that I'm okay being a little bit more fragile or brittle, but moves through food more easily? Or do I need something that's a little bit more tough and durable? Maybe I don't do as much thinning, but I, I need it to be a little bit thinner than it is right now. And so when we do that, it's the same that we're gonna be doing for sharpening, just at a lower angle. So if you can kind of see, like my angle is absurdly high up here, just so it's easy to see. Let's say I'm sharpening here. If I'm thinning, I'm gonna lower quite a bit. I wanna be pretty, pretty low while I'm doing that. In my experience, thinning tends to be somewhere in like the two to four degree range of things, whereas sharpening the edge tends to be somewhere in the 10 to 15 degree range of things for Japanese knives or like 15 to 20 degrees for, for German knives. On angles, there's some really cool stuff that I highly recommend people pay attention to. So if you have an iPhone, um, there is an app built in. Uh, I believe it's usually under utilities and it's called Measure. Um, when you load up the Measure app, the first thing you'll see is it's trying to like measure the room. But at the bottom, there's a little thing called the level. And with the level, you can get horizons and all that kind of stuff, but you can also see what angle the phone is being positioned at. So you can take this and put it down on your stone and zero it out. And then you can lift up and see what does 10 degrees look like? What does 15 degrees look like? Uh, and so let's see if it's easier for you guys to see this way. So here I am, this is zeroed out now. And as I lift up, here I am at 10 degrees. Here I am at 15 degrees. A lot of people don't really have an idea of how, how to sense what these angles are. And so they say like, oh, I was sharpening at 15 degrees and I look at what they're doing and it was way higher or way lower. Uh, I have a nice, easy way to do that. I hear something going on in the background. So if, if you guys have just joined uh, and you can mute your microphones, we're leaving Ryan's microphone unmuted. He's fielding questions and I'm trying to get to everything. If you do have questions, throw them in the chat uh, and Ryan will take a look and bug me about them in just a little bit. Okay. Um, there's John, one other way to, yes. Can you quickly, some people have questions, uh, just go over, obviously everything's specific to the type of knife and what you're doing, but kind of like a standard um, angle for like a chef's knife, uh, Japanese knife, yeah. what would your standard angles be? Somewhere be between 10 and 15 degrees per side. And it's not so important what angle you pick specifically. Uh, it's important to understand what those angles mean. Mm -hmm. The more acute that you go, the lower you go. So like closer to 10 degrees or even lower than that, the sharper the edge will feel, but the more fragile or brittle it's gonna be. The less acute you go, so 15 degrees or even higher, the more tough and durable it's gonna be, but the less sharp it's gonna feel. Uh, and so when I tell people what is the, the best for them, usually somewhere in that 10 to 15 degree range of things is a safe bet. And then use it for a little bit and see how it goes. There's not one specific right way to do all of this. A lot of it is about developing a relationship with your tool and starting to understand a little bit more about your knife and a little bit more about yourself. What do you like in cutting? How do things work well for you? How don't they? And then enacting game plans that effectively do that for you. So like if you use your knife all the time and it chips every time you do anything, maybe you wanna try a little bit less acute of an angle and see how that works for you. Or if you're using your knife and it just never feels as crisp or sharp as you want it to, maybe you try a little bit less acute angle and see how that works for you. Uh, don't go and do extreme changes, you know, do bit by bit, uh, but it's, it's really about doing something, using it, testing it, being introspective and thinking about how that works for you and then enacting game plans that further your needs. And then one, one last way to deal with angles, uh, just for anyone that is, I don't know, more like geometrically inclined, 90 degrees, 45 degrees, 22 and a half degrees, 11.25 degrees. You can just eyeball shit like that. So, <laughs> um, so if you don't have a smartphone, uh, that's another way to deal with that stuff. Any other questions on angles, sharpening, thinning, that kind of stuff uh, that we've covered so far? Or should we move on? Some, but they're getting uh, quite specific. Uh, I don't know if you want to move those to later, but some people just have yeah. some questions about like microchips and the type of bevel to put on it. And uh, Yeah, let's do that later on because uh, I feel like I can provide some context for that as I go through the rest of this stuff. So uh, the next thing that I want to talk about is asymmetry. Uh, 
it's a confusing subject for a lot of people. And uh, I think a lot of us bear the responsibility for that as we've told people, hey, stuff is like 50, 50 or 70, 30. Uh, this shit confused me for years. Um, because at first glance, someone says to you like, hey, this knife is like 90, 10. And you look at it and it's sharper more on one side than the other. You're like, oh yeah, naturally like 90, 10. When you really start to think about what that means, it becomes a lot more confusing. Does that mean that you spend 90% of the time on one side versus 10% on the other side? Or does it mean that in terms of ratios, the bevel is 90% of it is on one side and 10% is on the other? Uh, or is it a mix thereof? What's going on? Uh, and so some years ago, I decided to just start asking the craftsmen that I train under in Japan what the deal is. And their responses kind of cracked me up. Um, so initially, I'm like, hey, like, what's what's the deal with the asymmetry? Like, tell me about 70-30. And they're like, yeah, you know, 70-30, like, fuck off. That's what it is. It, it occurred to me, it's kind of like, um, as, a, as a cook, family always asks you how to do certain things, you know? And you're like, well, how, how do you cook a steak? I, I used to get that one a lot. How do you cook a steak? Well, the answer is kind of complicated when you really think about what we all do. We're like, all right, well, is it coming from the fridge or has it already been tempered? How thick is it? What cut is it? Uh, you know, what are you trying to do with it? What, what's the end result that you're going for? And then, and then we pay attention to those things. You're going to base it. There's a lot that goes into our thought process. But what do we tell people? They're like, all right, like high heat, sear it on one side, flip it over, sear it on the other side, <laughs> stick it in the hot oven until it's like almost the temp, pull it out, you know, rest it, slice it. It's like we give them really simple answers. And do they work? Certainly. Does it give people an understanding of what's going on? Absolutely not. So as I started to press further with the craftsmen, what I found out was that none of them are measuring the angles they sharpen at. No one, not a single person sits there and measures the angles they sharpen at. Not a single person that I've met counts the number of strokes or number of times they sharpen on one side versus the other. So as I asked about this continually, what I found is that kind of like what I was talking about in terms of angles, they're like, all right, well, you just have to use your knife and see what happens. The idea behind asymmetrical edges uh, depends on the region you're in. In Seki City, it's one of the few places that people are making asymmetrical edges intentionally. And their purpose for it is that by being slightly asymmetrical, they're able to get the knife just a little bit thinner directly behind the edge so it feels a little bit sharper, but it steers a little bit. Uh, in most other regions, including uh, Sakai, Sanjo, Kochi, uh, Echizen, people are actually shooting for generally more symmetrical knives but as a function of being right-hand dominant or making a lot of right-handed knives, uh, they, they tend to not do it so perfectly. So in dealing with asymmetrical knives, instead of worrying about 50-50, 60-40, 70-30, 90-10, all that kind of stuff, this is, this is what I like to tell people. Use your knife, see what happens, and then come with the game plan. Our goal is to have our knives cut straight and move through food easily. Uh, and in doing so, if you use your knife and you notice it steers like this, it means it's exerting more pressure on one side than the other, right? Uh, so we need to correct that. We need to make sure that it's exerting a little bit more pressure on the side it's steering towards so that it starts to cut straight. So if my knife cuts like this, it means that I need to exert more pressure on food in this side. And I can do that by either adjusting the amount of time that I spend sharpening on either side. So for instance, I can sharpen more on the side that it steers towards creating a larger bevel on that side to get it to exert more pressure in that direction and cut straight. Uh, I can adjust the angle on either side, same kind of effect, or I can do a combination thereof. Uh, and it doesn't really matter what you choose. What matters is you use your knife, you see what happens, you come up with the game plan. So say my knife steers this way and doesn't move through food the way that I want. I might lower the overall angle and sharpen a little bit more on one side than the other to get what I want in terms of performance. You can do it different ways. As long as you're using your knife and paying attention and thinking about how you want things to work, all you need to keep in mind is that the more acute you go overall, the sharper it's going to feel, but the more fragile or brutal it's going to be. The less acute you go overall, the more tough and durable it's going to be. Uh, but the less sharp it's going to feel. And then also, if you have a clad knife where, where you have soft steel and then like a hard core, uh, whether the, the cladding is Damascus or not makes no difference, uh, you want to then make sure that the apex of your edge, the center of your edge, is centered somewhat in the blade uh, so that you're actually using the core steel. So if you sharpen by adjusting the amount of time you spend sharpening on one side versus the other, the apex of the edge shifts off to the side. And if you do that in too extreme of a manner, you're no longer using the core steel of your knife to cut with, which sucks. Um, so does that make sense in terms of asymmetry for people? And then one more thing on that. You cannot turn a double bevel knife into a single bevel knife. And you cannot turn a single bevel knife into a double bevel knife. They're constructed differently. They work differently. Uh, so let them be. You want a double bevel knife? Get a double bevel knife. You want a single bevel knife? Get a single bevel knife. But don't try and turn one into the other. It never works out well. I think that's a mistake of a lot of young cooks for sure. 
Well, because, you know, we all see it and then no one provides context for us. Like, you know, in, in kitchens, we all learn the same way, which is that someone showed me and he learned from someone else and he learned from someone else, but never along the way is there like a professional in that shit. Like, think about, we were talking about uh, charcuterie the other day, right? You're like, okay, I just had to like go and figure, like someone gave me some stuff and I had to figure it out. And, and I did. And then you're going to go and teach people how to do that kind of stuff. Well, there's probably a lot that you're doing right because you take time and do research and learn stuff, but there's probably some mistakes that you're making or there's probably things that you don't understand completely. And so it's important for us to, to make sure that we're self-aware and we understand how to, how to research and how to ask questions and not always feel like you know, we, we know everything uh, that's going on. Uh, so I think that happens a lot with, with knives, but it happens certainly with everything. You know, people are like, uh, you should do butchery this way versus that way. You should cut this way versus that way. When you start to think about what people are telling you, just ask why, what, what's the reason behind it? Why does it work this way? As soon as you can understand the why, then you have the ability to critically think and problem solve a little bit more effectively. So uh, any other questions pertaining to asymmetry that popped up? Yeah, I think this, uh, you know, may be obvious to some, but not to others. Uh, someone has a question about whether they know, like how do you know if a single bevel or double bevel? Cool. Yeah, so uh, that's actually much easier than you might expect. All right. This is a single bevel knife. Uh, if you look at it, this is one side. This is the other side. They look nothing like each other, right? This looks drastically different from this side entirely. This has a huge bevel, uh, has the Shinogi line on here, which is this little ridge right here. Uh, this side is actually hollow ground. So if you look at it this way, it kind of dips in and there's like a flat rim around the edge. Uh, they don't look at all the same on either side. Single bevel knife. Now, here is a double bevel knife. Look at one side, look at the other side. That looks pretty much the same. Now, the bevel might be larger on one side than the other. Cool. It's still a double bevel knife. Uh, that's probably the easiest way to tell the difference between the two of them. Um, and so that's generally what I would recommend. Now, there are some knives that are double bevel, but highly asymmetrical. Uh, and those would be generally boning knives. So like Koneski, Hankotsu, uh, those kinds of things. Let me see if I have one down here somewhere. Uh, cool. Um, so like this is a Honeski and this looks very different from this side. But if you look at the edge closely, you'll see that there is a little bevel on both sides that are sharpened kind of like a double bevel knife. With these boning knives like Honosuke and Hankotsu, the idea is that by sharpening more asymmetrically as a function of how much time we spend on either side, we're able to shift the apex of the edge off to one side and get it to ride as close to the bone as possible. So we get a little bit less loss when we're doing stuff. But those knives tend to steer a little bit more when you're cutting tall, dense foods, uh, and they're just not great all-purpose knives. Um, but yeah, that, that should answer hopefully that question. Any other questions on that subject before we move on? Um, let's see. Someone was asking about micro beveling and does that start from a single or a double bevel knife? So you can micro bevel on both single and double bevel knives. I almost regret putting out videos on micro beveling because I think it's just a horribly misunderstood subject. <laughs> micro bevels are not like an end all be all fix it for, for everything. They're really useful in a very narrow limited uh, number of situations. Um, the idea behind a micro bevel, by the way, is on your finishing stone. Let me draw this shit out really quick. Give me a second. So uh, say that this is just your general bevel over here, uh, all the way at the edge. And say that this is like even zoom, zoomed in to just the very, very last little bit of the edge. If your knife is extremely thin and or extremely hard, that would otherwise be really, really brittle if you used it that way, a micro bevel can alleviate some of that without sacrificing so much in terms of cross-sectional geometry. So if you have a really thin knife and you love the way it moves through foods, uh, but it just chips a little bit more than you would like, you can sacrifice a little bit in maximum potential sharpness in favor of having a more tough and durable edge while still preserving cross-sectional geometry. And the way that we do that is by at the very edge, Can you see over there that we've just, at the very last little bit of the edge, taken on one side uh, a much more obtuse angle and, and sharpened it just a little bit. And so on my finishing stone, if I'm sharpening like this at the very end, I would lift up just a little bit and do maybe one or two really light strokes uh, and then uh, take off the burr on the backside. Um, and, and what that does is it gets rid of the last little bit of the edge that would be weak, brittle, 
uh, or otherwise cause problems for me while I get to maintain a thinner cross-sectional geometry overall. Uh, it's not a good idea on knives that aren't extremely thin and hard because you sacrifice performance for very little uh, in return. On single bevel knives, because they tend to be so much more acute, uh, because they're sharpened predominantly on one side at an angle, so like say a uh, Yanagiba is sharpened at like 10 to 12 degrees on one side, well, that's a 10 to 12 degree inclusive angle versus something like this Nakiri or a Gyuto that might be sharpened at 10 degrees on either side, which is pretty acute for a Gyuto, well, that's still a 20 degree inclusive angle. So it's a, a much less acute angle overall. So on single bevel knives, because of how thin they are and because of how hard they are, micro bevels tend to be much more common, much more useful, um, but really they should only be used when they're fixing a problem of the knife being too brittle, too prone to chipping, uh, but you're trying to maintain a specific kind of cross-sectional geometry as much as you can. Cool. So, yeah. It's a sharp man, I think. What's that? I think uh, everyone's good on questions. You get to cool. you get to sharpen enough. All right, sweet. So uh, we've gone over asymmetry. The last thing that I want to go over is how we deal with the tips of knives. Uh, mm -hmm. When we're sharpening, it's important that we're maintaining consistent bevel all the way through from the heel to the tip. So when you look at the heel of the knife, from your edge to the top of your bevel should be the same as it is in the middle of your knife and towards the tip of your knife. And what's really interesting about this is that if you're maintaining consistent bevel all the way through the blade, I'm gonna show you this on a single bevel knife because it's a little bit easier to see. So here you can see that the distance from the Shinogi line down to the edge is the same here, here, and here. If it's the same all the way through, in order to sharpen the tip of my knife, the distance uh, from here to from the edge to the top of the Shinogi line or the top of your bevel needs to come into contact with the stone when I'm sharpening. And that tells me how I need to adjust for my tip sharpening every time that I sharpen the tips of knives. Uh, and that adjustment is always the same. And it's going to be lifting up a little bit and rotating towards the spine a little bit. And by doing so, I can make sure that that part along the spine comes into contact with my stone. There are a number of ways to do this, and I'll show you once we get into the actual sharpening what that looks like. But just keep in mind that regardless of what side you're sharpening on uh, or what knife you're sharpening, at some point in order to sharpen the tip of the knife effectively, there will be some adjustment of lifting up a little bit and rotating back towards the spine a little bit. Uh, so that's, that's what we're gonna be dealing with in tip sharpening. On knives with distal taper, you also notice that uh, they get thinner as they go towards the tip, uh, but the bevel width stays the same all the way through. And so what's interesting about those is it means that we have to slightly dynamically adjust with our angle all the way through from the heel to the tip. So the heel tends to be a little bit less acute and the tip tends to be a little bit more acute which makes the tip more appropriate for detail-oriented work and the heel more appropriate for rough, uh, rough work. Uh, it's kind of cool that that's built into the way that a lot of knives are constructed when they have distal taper. Uh, distal taper meaning the, the way that they taper from the spine, on the spine from the heel to the tip here. Uh, so getting thinner as they go towards the tip. Uh, so that should cover uh, all the basic concepts that I want to go over. I also want to go over the mistakes that we can make uh, how to recognize them and how to fix them. And then I'm going to go and show you guys body positioning and what all the stuff looks like as we do it. There are seven mistakes that you can make when you are sharpening double bevel kitchen knives. There's a little bit more with single bevel, but just trying to keep it simple for now. Uh, six of them you can see, one of them you can feel. The one that you can feel is inconsistent or uneven burr formation. We went over that a little bit earlier. Uh, so we're going to be feeling for a burr constantly as we go through this, and I'll show you different ways to do that. Uh, if it's inconsistent, you'll notice that you're removing more metal in one place than the other, and the shape of your knife is going to change over time. The other six things we can see, and we can see them especially well when we color in our knife with sharpening. So I'm going to walk over this way for a second and flip my camera around, and maybe you guys can see a little bit better here. All right. So when you color in your blade with Sharpie, not only do you want to color in the edge of the blade, but you want to color in some distance behind the edge as well. Uh, the reason for this you'll see in just a little bit, but this will give you high contrast, instant visual feedback uh, with respect to what's going on. So the six mistakes that you can make are uh, angle too high, angle too low, under rotation at the tip, over rotation at the tip, not lifting up enough and lifting up too much. And they show up in really distinct patterns. So here we go. Uh, in this one, our angle is too high. So what happens? That means that the spine of the knife is too high relative to the stone. The Sharpie gets removed at the very edge of the blade, but not the distance behind it. When you see that, that means that you need to lower the angle a little bit uh, to be able to be consistent with the angle that you're sharpening at. When you do this and you're not paying attention, this means that your knife is gonna become thicker behind the edge really, really quickly. 
uh, and it's going to start to wedge in foods a little bit more. Uh, so it's going to mess up cross-sectional geometry. When, when your angle is too low, you'll notice that the edge of the knife remains black and the area behind it becomes shiny. This is really cool when you're trying to thin your knife. In fact, it's exactly what you're trying to do when you thin your knife, but it sucks when you're trying to sharpen your knife because you're not touching the edge. So it's just not gonna get sharper. So when you see this, uh, this is gonna make your knife a little bit thinner behind the edge, but it's not gonna get it sharper. This means that you need to raise the angle up a little bit. So instead of being uh, too close to the stone, you wanna raise the angle up just a little bit. When you are sharpening the tip of your knife and you under rotate, meaning that you lift up, but you don't rotate towards this fine enough, you'll see the bevel size decreases as you go towards the tip. When you do this, this is what causes like bird's beak tips to develop, for instance. Uh, in this case, you need to rotate just a little bit more towards the spine as you do your sharpening. And the next one down here, so it's all mirrored over here, so it's tough to see. This is uh, over rotation. So you rotate too much towards the tip as you go. The angle uh, lowers as you move towards the tip. So the bevel size increases as you go. This is gonna cause your tip to round up a little bit more since you're sharpening a little bit more. It's also gonna cause the tip of your knife to be a little bit thinner overall. Um, so you wanna avoid doing that. So rotate a little bit less. When you uh, don't lift up enough, you'll notice that the tip of your knife remains black, but the area behind it looks like you've just lowered the angle. Uh, this also causes a bird's beak or a frown in the, in the blade. So you wanna be cautious of that. Uh, and when you see this, you wanna lift up a little bit more. When you've lifted up too much, it's a little bit harder to see, uh, but the idea behind it is that, um, you just, you wanna make sure you're not lifting your elbow up quite as much because you're gonna grind away the tip of your knife is not gonna be sharp at all. Uh, so when you do everything appropriately, you'll see that the sharpie gets removed evenly and consistently along the bevel. So those are the seven mistakes that we need to pay attention to. Uh, and throughout the course of this, I will try and make sure that I show you what those mistakes look like when you make them, uh, how to recognize them and, and what fixing them looks like. So now on to sharpening. Um, the, the first thing when it comes to sharpening that I like to talk about is body positioning. Uh, and the body positioning that we use for sharpening is the same kind of body positioning I recommend for people when they're cutting too. A lot of people, when they walk up to their cutting board, they stand like this and they square off with their cutting board. And they do the same thing when they're sharpening, they sharpen just like this. Your body gets really locked in. You don't have a lot of range of motion with your arm and it's tough to stay balanced while you're leaning over looking at what you're doing. So um, are there a lot of left-handed people out here? Uh, if you're left-handed, can you just type in the chat left-handed really quick? Um, and then for those people, are you the kind of left-handed people that need to see stuff being done left-handed or are you good at translating stuff being done right-handed into left-handed in your own head? I just wanna make sure I'm showing you guys stuff effectively. Uh, so uh, Ryan, what do you see for lefties? Ryan, I think you're on mute. Sorry about that. Uh, only a Some handful of, of them and most of them are either sharp and right-handed or they're good to watch right-handed and Okay, issue. cool. If, if through the course of this, one of you guys needs to see something done left-handed, let me know and I'll, I'll switch it up so you can see that. I just want to make sure that I'm showing people in a way that's easy for them to understand. So as I approach my stone, here's where I'm going to be sharpening. I want to take a step back with my right foot. Uh, so my feet are now positioned like this on the floor. You can see this one's a little bit further back. This one's a little bit forward. This is pointing forward and this one's kind of pointing off to the side a little bit. It's almost like if I wanted to fight, I would stand kind of like this. My legs are a little bit tighter together than they would be if I was fighting. Uh, what happens here is that now my arm has much greater range of motion. So it's a lot easier for me to move. Uh, and when I look down at what I'm doing, I have a little bit more stable base. So I'm not as off balance. Uh, this is really helpful in sharpening, but it's also really helpful in cutting uh, because it shifts the work area from the center of your board to the lower right-hand corner of your board. So now as you cut, my knuckles overhang the floor instead of my cutting board. So I never have knuckle clearance issues. Even if I use a really narrow knife, um, my arm, again, has much better range of motion. It's easier for me to look down at where I'm cutting so I can gauge cut thickness without being off balance. Uh, it's just a really helpful body positioning. So it's the same position we'll use for sharpening, the same position we use for cutting. So again, my feet are positioned kind of like, like this. Uh, so now my body has shifted to the side a little bit. All right, uh, let's get this stone wet. So if you haven't uh, and you're following along and trying to sharpen at the same time, if you wanna soak your stone, uh, if you uh, have it already soaked, let's pull out um, whatever stone you want to get started on. I'm starting on a medium grit stone uh, for the sake of making this as simple as possible. So I have splashed some water on my stone. My stone is at a slightly uh, downward angle away from me. So like this part of the stone is a little bit higher. This part of the stone is a little bit lower. It's not necessary that you do that. Uh, if your stone is totally flat on the surface, it's fine. I like this because I get water control. If I splash water up here, it goes that way. I don't have to rub it all over the stone surface. 
Uh, and ergonomically, as I move further away from myself and I have this slight downward angle, my wrist has less of a tendency to tilt back towards me as I sharpen. Uh, when your stone is flat, you might have a little bit more tendency for your wrist to come back up at you. And you can mitigate that as long as you're conscious of it. So here we go. My stone is, is wet. Uh, I have my knife. I'm going to start with my grip. So my first grip is going to start from a pinch grip. Uh, so the pinch grip is going to look like this. We're going to make like the Obama fist kind of thing. Uh, you know, all right. And then we're going to relax our uh, thumb and index finger. And we're going to pinch up on the blade way up here. And then our middle finger is going to kind of get jammed into this neck area of the knife called the choil. So this is our main, main grip strength is in these three fingers. Our last two fingers wrap lightly around the handle. There's very little pressure in them. And the handle fits just off the crook of my palm over here. This is a pinch grip. From this pinch grip, we're going to move our index finger up to the spine and our thumb down towards the heel. So this is the grip that I'm going to use as I sharpen the first side of the knife. Make sense? All right, so now I have that. I have this hand. I'm going to put the knife down on the stone, OK? Here, I want to find the angle that I'm sharpening at. And again, you can eyeball that by putting it at 90 degrees, then halving that for 45, halving that for 22 and a half, and halving that again for like 11 and a quarter, and then kind of finagle around in that 10 to 15 degree range. Uh, or you can use an iPhone or Android to kind of measure stuff if you'd like. So my angle of approach, meaning this angle here, is roughly 45 to 60 degrees relative to the stone. So this would be perpendicular, 90 degrees. We want to be just a little bit offset. We have a few reasons for this. One, it's much more comfortable for my arm to be like this than it is like this or like this. Uh, two, I get increased surface area contact with my stone. So when it's diagonal like this, I make contact with this much. When it's perpendicular, I make contact with this much. There's a significant difference. Uh, and lastly, it helps in terms of giving me an offset from my direction of motion relative to the way the knife wobbles. So when my knife is perpendicular and I'm moving straight forward and back, it wobbles in the same direction that I'm moving. When I have a little bit of an offset, the way it wobbles and my direction of motion are a little bit different. So it allows me to maintain a more consistent angle. So again, pinch grip, index finger to the spine, thumb down towards the heel, angle of approach is down. And then I want to get two to three fingers as close to the edge as possible without touching the stone. If you feel the stone underneath your fingers, they're going to start bleeding at some point. Uh, so unless that's your thing, uh, I would just back them up a little bit up the blade. I don't know, some people like bleeding, who knows? Um, so here we go, two to three fingers. My motion is gonna be straight forward and straight back. And I use the heel of my knife and the edge of my stone. Here you can see here, the heel of my knife and the edge of my stone is reference points. So I know if I start here and I'm like one centimeter from the edge of the stone, as I come up here, I should still be one centimeter. As I come back, it should still be one centimeter. So I'm gonna move forward, back, forward, back, forward, back. My pressure is gonna be applied with this hand and this arm should be as loose and relaxed as possible. I don't wanna apply any upward or downward pressure with it. And in fact, all I want this hand to do is be responsible for my angle of approach and my angle of sharpening, all right? Uh, it has to help out with the motion a little bit, but I want you to focus on this hand doing the motion uh, because what this hand is gonna do is it's gonna stay over the center line of the stone. So now we have pressure distributed evenly over the surface of the stone and we're not pressing off on the sides, uh, getting a lot of pressure on the corners. So again, straight forward, straight back, straight forward, straight back. My fingers are tightly grouped together, not spread out. Where my fingers are applying pressure is where the bulk of sharpening is taking place. So as I go through my sharpening, I wanna make sure that they're touching all the way along the blade as I go. So straight forward, straight back, and then I can move down the blade. Now I can either stop and move my fingers and go again, or as I sharpen, I can just kind of dynamically adjust and move my fingers up as I go. Any questions on this so far? We have a question for when you're gonna switch sides. Okay, uh, I'm gonna switch in just a second. So I just wanna go through uh, what we're looking for and I, as I do this. So this is not cutie. So there's a little bit less lifting up and adjusting towards the spine, but it still has to be a little bit. And there are a few different ways that I do that, but let me grab a different blade that I think makes that a little bit easier to see. So I go through my sharpening here. And as I come up towards the curvy section of the blade, I wanna make my adjustment for, for the tip. Remember, my tip adjustment is always lifting up and rotating back towards the spine. Uh, one way that I can do that is by swinging my elbow out. And as I come towards myself, uh, lifting the blade up and rotating towards the spine. And at the very bottom here, I can stop and check and see, did I lift up and rotate enough to get the bevel width along the spine in contact? Or do I need to lift up, rotate more or less? Uh, what's going on? So I can always stop and see there. And as I come back down, uh, riding back into the same angle that I was sharpening up for the rest of the blade. That's one way to do stuff. What I prefer, however, 
is as I come up towards the tip, I will tuck my arm inside. So I'm moving forward, coming through stuff. And then as I come up towards the curvy section, I move forward and on my backstroke, I tuck my arm inside. I see the pressure question. I'll get to that in a second. Um, so tucking my arm inside, moving my fingers up towards the tip. Now, as I move forward, nothing's really happening, but on my backstroke, I'm rotating my forearm just a little bit. You can see how this is kind of rotating over here. And as I do that forearm rotation, that takes care of my lifting up and rotating back in one movement. And then as I come forward, I'm dropping all the way back down so that the rest of the blade comes into contact. And so lifting up, coming back, lifting up, coming back. And so all it is, is me doing this. And by doing this, it takes care of both lifting up and rotating towards the spine. It's not a big rotation. It's not a huge amount of energy that I have to put into it, um, but it's enough to make sure that the bevel width is consistent and even. So I wanna make sure that the bevel width comes into contact along the spine of the knife. So that's the tip adjustment that I'm looking for. Uh, with respect to pressure, uh, I'm applying pressure generally on my edge trailing stroke. So pressure, relax, pressure, relax. If you apply pressure in both directions, it's not really the end of the world. Um, edge trailing pressure does tend to be a little bit helpful in terms of getting clean edges, maintaining angle consistency. Uh, but uh, again, you, you, can, you can apply pressure in both directions if you'd like. Uh, just most people in Japan tend to do it on the edge trailing stroke for double bevel knives. So once I have gone through the first side of the knife and I've done my tip adjustments and I look, my bevel width is consistent from heel to tip. So I'm actually looking at it right now. Then I wanna feel for it. And I use my index finger and my middle finger uh, as opposed to my thumb. So I sharpen this side of the knife, which means that this side of the knife is where the burr is gonna be. So I place my thumb on the side that I sharpen and my index finger and middle finger on the side that the burr should be on. And they're on the side of the blade over here. And then I slowly run them along the side of the blade up across the edge. I'm not coming over the edge this way. I'm following just straight along the edge here. Uh, and as I do that, I'll feel a little bit of metal tug at my fingers. Now you can flip the knife over and again, putting your thumb on the side that you're gonna be uh, not checking on the fingers on the opposite side and run them along the edge here. And you can see what it feels like. And so you can compare the two sides and see, hey, do I feel something, do I not? If you do feel something, you then wanna make sure that it's the same size all the way through from the heel to the tip to make sure that your burr is the same size all the way through from the heel to the tip so that you're not removing more metal in one place than the other. Uh, so I did not do a great job uh, on this particular blade. So I'm gonna go through. It was strong here, weak here at the, at the bottom and weak here at the top. So I'm gonna go through and do the entire blade again, but I'm gonna focus more on the areas that were weak and less on the areas that were strong, trying to even things out. And then I'll check my work again. Okay, now, now I'm where I wanna be. So again, thumb on the side that you sharpen, uh, index finger and middle finger on the opposite side and running them along the side of the blade. You certainly don't want to move towards the edge because you can cut yourself. You don't want to move laterally across the edge because you're going to cut yourself. Uh, and if you try and run over the edge this way, you're not going to feel shit. So that's not really helpful. So again, following along the side over here. So I have a burr. It's even inconsistent from the heel to the tip. Now I want to switch over to the other side. Are there any questions uh, that I should get to before I do that? For flip, no, nothing's coming up so much. Uh, now that you're flipping, uh, Isaac has a question, but he would like to unmute and ask you to explain it a little yeah. bit better. Yeah, go for it. Go ahead and unmute and go ahead with your question. And if you're unable to unmute, let me know and I will unmute you for yourself. You said Isaac, correct? Isaac Agard, yeah. Cool. Let's unmute Isaac and see what's going on. All right, Isaac, uh, can you try speaking and let's see what's up? You there? Hmm. Doesn't seem like we can hear you, Isaac. Yeah. All right, if you wanna type your question, uh, that might be a little bit more helpful now. Um, yeah, just didn't yeah. seem like that was working, sorry. Okay, I'll ask what he was kind of saying. He. Um... He said he heard that others might, sorry, one sec, one sec, there's a lot of questions. He's seen people switch hands uh, when they switch sides of the knife. So opposite, opposite sides of the blade will get sharpened with the switching hand. And he's, he was asking if that, you know, kind of makes sense and if there's any- Yeah, you, you can do that. that. There's, there's nothing wrong with that. Uh, it's, it's not what I do. 
uh, that's not true. I do it for some blades. Uh, I do it when I'm doing like wide bevel uh, knives uh, where, where our customers want everything to look like nice and even the same on both sides. I have to make sure that I'm mirroring what I do on, on both sides a little bit more in, in those cases. Um, today, I'm not gonna show that. Uh, I guess I could. Let me show you what I do first and then I'll show you the switching hands method um, and, and we'll go from there. Uh, but yes, uh, not all people switch hands when they're sharpening Japan. In my experience, the vast majority of people do not, uh, but some people do, um, and there is nothing wrong with it. So what I tend to do is when I go to the next side, I'm just using the same hand. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to show you that, and then I'll show you switching hands. Uh, are there Isaac any other questions we should get to before to, uh, I do that? Worry. Isaac says you don't need to worry about switching hands. It's no worries. <laughs> uh, it's not a big deal. I'm sure that there are some other people that would like to see it as well. So I'm going to do it, um, and we'll see how it goes. So we've sharpened the first side of the knife, the right side here. Now I'm going to sharpen the left side of the knife. I'm going to start again from pinch grip. So I have my main pinch grip here, but instead of moving my index finger to the spine, I'm going to move my thumb to the spine and my index finger down towards the heel. So my grip is going to look like this. Now, as I do this, my angle of approach has to be perpendicular to the stone. If I have an angle like this, the handle gets in the way and inhibits my ability to sharpen at a low enough angle for me to be happy with what's going on. So I start off perpendicular. Aside from that, things are pretty similar. My body positioning is the same. My fingers get as close to the edge as possible without touching the stones. So I definitely don't wanna feel them under my fingers. Uh, and my pressure is on the edge trailing stroke. So I'm relaxing and then applying pressure, relaxing and applying pressure. And then as I move down the blade, just a little bit. I just need enough so I have clearance to get back into that 45-ish degree angle of approach. So I'm, I'm transitioning this way as I go through stuff. As I come up towards the tip, again, I'm going to need to make an adjustment for the tip, uh, which is lifting up and rotating back towards the spine. If I want to do that in the same kind of way that I was doing on the first side, I can take a step to the side with my feet. So instead of my feet being positioned like this, now I'm over here. And as I do that, I can then do this kind of rocking motion. It's almost like a backswing in golf. Um, but the idea is that as I'm coming back towards myself, I'm lifting up and rotating back towards the spine. And here I can stop and see, did I lift up and rotate enough to get the bevel width in contact? And then coming back down. That's one way to do it. Uh, another way that you can do it is through small incremental adjustments. Uh, so as I come up towards the tip and I get to the curvy section over here, say I'm sharpening right over here. I'm gonna move forward, backward one time, and then I'm gonna make the tiniest adjustment, lifting up and rotating towards the back. Uh, so I'm sharpening just a little bit to the side. And then again, tiny adjustment, tiny adjustment. And I'll continue to do those small adjustments, forward, backward, small adjustment, forward, backward, small adjustment, as I work my way up towards the very tip. And again, as I get all the way up, I can stop and see, did I make all the adjustments that I want to make appropriately? Did I lift up and rotate where I want to? And if so, everything is good. And if not, I can, I can make my adjustments there. I want those adjustments to be as tightly grouped together as possible. The smaller and tighter group those adjustments are, the smoother the curve that I'm creating is. So uh, that's, that's the way that I would do stuff if I didn't switch hands. And if I did switch hands, I would just adjust my body positioning. So instead of my feet being like this, I would be like this. The grip would again be the pinch grip, index finger to the spine, thumb down towards the heel. And then everything would just be a mirror of what I did on the first side of the knife. So that, that's also totally possible. Yeah. All right, any questions so far about this? No, seems to be good to go. Okay, cool. So I have now gone through and formed a burr on one side of the knife that's consistent even from heel to tip, and then done the same thing on the other side. And I've done so with a consistent angle so that when I look at my knife, there is an even and consistent bevel. There's not a lot of wobble. If you start to see that in some areas you're uh, a little bit too high and in some areas you're a little bit too low, uh, you're not going to get as crisp or clean of a bevel as an issue, but it shows up in Sharpie. So I'm going to show you guys at the end of this what all those mistakes look like, how to recognize them and what to do about them, but that would be one of those mistakes. So uh, sharpen one side, sharpen the other side, form a burr, even consistent. I'm now going to switch out my stone. So I'm done with my first stone and I can move to my second stone. So if you had a coarse stone, you'd be moving to a medium grit stone. If you had a medium grit stone, you'd be moving to a finishing stone. Being that we started with a medium grit stone, we're going to move to a finishing stone. So I went from my 800 grit stone to now I have a 6,000 grit stone over here. And this one happens to be a splash and go stone. I'm gonna take a sip of my drink and then get back to this. So the first thing that I wanna do here is I wanna look closely at my blade 
And I want to see what does that scratch pattern look like? Am I able to see visible scratches along the edge? If so, how large are they? What is it? I need to know what it looks like so that when I'm getting rid of those scratches and replacing them with the, the fine scratches from my finishing stone, uh, I'm, I'm aware of what I should be looking for. So now that I've looked at the blade, I have an idea of what it looked like to begin with. I can start doing the same process again on my finishing stone. On my medium grit stone, I was using my medium pressure. Uh, it's not that you should use heavy pressure on core stones and medium pressure on medium stones and light pressure on finishing stones. In general, when you're trying to remove a lot of metal, whether that's on a core stone or a medium grit stone, you use a little bit heavier pressure. When you're trying to get the bulk of your sharpening done, the normal sharpening that you'd be doing, you use a little bit lighter pressure. And at the very end of our process, we'll use the lightest pressure. So, so far I've been in that like five to 700 gram range of things for myself. Plus or minus a little bit, it doesn't really matter. It's just to give you like a good idea of what a safe bet range might be. Now here on my finishing stone, I'm gonna do the same shit that I did on my medium grit stone. I'm gonna put the knife down. I have my angle approach the way I want. My fingers are as close to the edge as possible. Pressure on my edge trailing stroke, relax on my edge leading stroke. And then I slowly crawl my fingers up the blade. And again, you can always stop, move your fingers and go again. What you don't wanna do is stop, readjust and then put them all back down. You're not as likely to uh, be able to maintain a consistent angle that way uh, as if you constantly have the blade in contact with the stone. So uh, bringing my arm inside for the tip, lifting up and rotating back towards the spine through my small forearm adjustment, which you can see here, right? I'm doing that as I pull back towards myself. And I get like this kind of swishing sound when I do this. Uh, as I move forward, I'm dropping back down so that this part of the blade still comes into contact with the, the knife. So I'm not just sharpening the tip when I'm doing the tip. I get the tip and then I transition that back into the rest. And that makes a kind of swishing sound if it doesn't, it generally is because you're not dropping all the way down so that this part comes back into contact with the blade. Uh, so that's something to be cognizant of. So now I want to look at my blade again, and I want to make sure that all the scratches from my previous stone are gone, and they're replaced with the scratches that I expect to see from this finishing stone in this case, uh, which is a much shinier, more mirror-like thing. And then I'm going to feel for the burr again. And my goal is that I should still be able to feel a burr, but it should be smaller than what it was when I first started. So I'm not trying to form as large of a burr. I want to make sure it's smaller each step of the way that I, I go. Uh, so that at the end, when I remove it, it's not so difficult to do. So I have now an even and consistent burr again. And I flip over and do the same thing on the opposite side one more time. And so here I've done small incremental adjustments as I go up. And now I'll show you the other way, which is that kind of rocking motion. So again, lifting up and rotating back towards the spine for the tip. For, for people that are confused by that tip thing, if you've ever rolled like a, a coin around, uh, when you spin a coin around, eventually it starts to do this kind of motion where it looks like it's doing this. And if you imagine that your knife is one small part of that, that's kind of what that adjustment looks like. So if you take like a quarter at home and you spin it around and it starts to do this kind of motion, just imagine that your knife is just one small part of that adjustment. And that's kind of what you're lifting up and rotating back towards the spine should be looking like as you do that. So hopefully that makes sense of things a little bit more. So now I've gone through, I haven't done my core stone, but we'll say core stone, medium grit stone, finishing stone. I've gone through the bulk of my sharpening process. Now I wanna get into dealing with the burr. And so the way that we deal with the burr is a two-step process. One, we wanna reduce its connection to the edge and uh, to reduce the size of the burr a little bit more effectively uh, through this. And then we'll go through and remove the burr. And so this is where I start to do stropping motions on my stone. Uh, so for those of you who aren't familiar with what stropping is, stropping is an edge trailing stroke. So what I mean by that is as I move my knife across the stone, the edge is at the back of that motion. So for instance, edge trailing, edge leading, edge leading, edge trailing. We're going to be using edge trailing strokes that cover the entire length of the blade. So there are a number of ways that you can do that. On the first side, what I like to do is normally I'll have my hand here, but I'm going to take this hand away for a second so you guys can see what I'm talking about a little bit more. What I like to do is I start by being in the lower left-hand corner of my stone and I lift up and rotate back so that the bevel width uh, is in contact at the very tip of the knife. And from here, I move to the right, slowly dropping and transitioning back into my normal sharpening angle for the rest of the blade. So following a kind of almost J-like stroke, I come through and do this. And I'm doing that at the exact same angle that I sharpened at previously. So one time like that. And you can also start in this corner and just move forward. The reason that I do this kind of J-shaped stroke is that it gives you a little bit uh, more time before you have to kind of move the tip forward into stuff so you're not gouging the stone. When you start here, 
the tip is already facing directly into the stone. And so it's possible to gouge the stone if it's a soft stone and you're not as comfortable with sharpening. So again, that J-shaped stroke. So I do one time on this side. And on the back side, I can start here and come back towards myself, lifting up and rotating towards the spine as I come up towards the tip. I can do the opposite of that J-shaped stroke, or I can start here and come back. Doesn't really matter what you choose. You'll find out what's comfortable for you. But the idea is that I'm going to do one time on one side, one time on the other side. So I'm alternating sides each time I go. And I'm doing the entire length of the blade as I do this. And this is where I'm using relatively light pressure. I just want to make sure that the blade is in contact with the stone. And the idea behind this is that we're sharpening at the same angle that we were doing before, and we're bending the burr back and forth and back and forth and back and forth. And in doing so, we're able to weaken its connection to the edge. Again, not so dissimilar from what happens to a paperclip, uh, and also reduce it further in size. There's not a set number of these that you need to do. Um, I tell people just pick an arbitrary number between like five and 10 and do that number of sets and then see. Uh, so let's say we took five. So I'm gonna do five. So one, one, two, two, three, three, four, four, five, five. Now I'm gonna feel. Can I feel a burr steel? Is it there? I can actually still feel one. So I wanna go a little bit more. And now I feel again. Now I can't feel anything anymore. That's good. That's a sign that we've been able to, uh, A, reduce the size of the burr, and B, weaken its connection to the edge decently. So now I don't have a, a burr-free edge yet, but I do have a sharp edge that feels really sharp. You can cut with it. It's just not going to hold up as long. Until you get rid of the burr, your edge is just not going to be as stable or strong because it's got this floppy piece of metal hanging off the end of it. So this is where I use these blue non-scratch sponges and I use them because again, there's no abrasive in this side of it. Uh, the green ones have a lot of abrasive. Uh, I'm also gonna grab a wine cork so that people can see what that's like. Uh, so you can also use wine cork, uh, hard felt, uh, soft wood like balsa, something like that. Uh, if you're using wine cork or balsa or felt, what you can do is you can take the knife and put it against the thing and then slice through it. Just a few times and you'll start to feel with your first slice, there's a little bit of resistance and the resistance decreases each time you cut until you start to come to an equilibrium where it feels the same consistently as you cut through it. And that's generally a sign that you've done a good job at burr removal. My way, I think is a little bit easier. Uh, so I tend to do this. So uh, my sponge is here. My knife is at a pretty high angle, like 80, 90 degrees. And then I just kind of lightly swipe both sides of the, the edge uh, along the sponge. And the idea is that it's not so aggressive, but it's aggressive enough to catch whatever burr might be on there. And I can feel again and make sure that I don't have any burr on there at all, which I don't anymore. And in case my burr removal process has caused any damage to the edge, which is possible, certainly, as we're ripping a piece of metal off from the edge, I'll go through and strop maybe like one or two more times. Now, you can do this process of burr removal like two or three times. The more you do it, the greater potential you have for things to go wrong. So I wouldn't recommend running out and doing it, you know, like, 15 times, but two to three times seems to be a pretty safe bet. And so when I'm done now, I should have a functionally sharp, clean edge. Uh, the best way to test it is just go cut food, but you can use your thumbnail to test some of it. So you can take the, the knife and put it against your thumbnail and pull, like you're gonna slice through your thumbnail. Please don't slice through your thumbnail. Uh, it should stick like tape. It should feel like it just doesn't wanna move at all. Or like if you've ever touched a CNN me, it kind of feels like that. Uh, so mm -hmm. that's one way to test things. Another way to test things, again, with my thumbnails, I'll take the edge and I'll rest it on my thumbnail and then I'll flex the edge into my thumbnail a little bit and I'll rock my thumb underneath it. What I'm looking for here is to see, does something bend up and stay? Is, is the burr still there? Did I miss it? Uh, does the edge flex under my thumbnail? This tells me how thin or thick my knife is behind the edge. So I get an idea of how brittle or fragile it might be or how tough and durable it might be. Um, so those are a couple of tests you can do. You can also always, um, you know, grab a piece of paper and cut it. It's not the end all be all of stuff, but uh, it certainly tells you if there's like little chips or nicks that you've missed along the way or how consistent or even of a job you've done uh, in terms of your sharpening. It will feel different in certain areas if you haven't done the same kind of work all the way through. Uh, so those are a few ways to test, uh, test the edge. But that's the, the basics of what it is we're trying to do. So um, the next thing that I wanna do is show you guys how to use Sharpie and see what those mistakes look like, both when I make the mistakes, but also how they show up in Sharpie in real life, and then what we can do about those to fix them. 
Um, are there any questions in the meantime, before I get started on that, that are about the things we've gone over already? Someone has a specific question that says, uh, any thoughts on the three finger test that Murray Carter uses? Yeah, it works know. too. Uh, I mean, there's, the, the idea behind the three finger test, right, is that you're resting three fingers along the edge and you're trying to like kind of slide them, um, obviously without cutting yourself. It's similar to the thumbnail test in, in the sense that when you have an edge that's sharp and has an appropriate amount of bite for kitchen use, it digs into the, the pads of your fingertips. Uh, and so it feels kind of sticky. It doesn't want to slide. Uh, obviously, if you're not comfortable with this, you haven't done it a lot, uh, you can cut yourself, uh, you know, because your edge is sharp. Um, it's, it's certainly one way to test and it, it can be an effective way of seeing how your edge is. I still think that more than the thumbnail test, more than any of that stuff, the best thing you can do is just go cut food. They're kitchen knives. That's what they're designed to do. Just go cut some shit, see how it works. And, you know, and then come up with uh, what you want to do about it. You know, was it as sharp as you wanted? Was it not? Does it move through food the way you want or does it not? And, and now that you have a, a good understanding of, you know, what angles mean, what cross-sectional geometry means, what burrs are, uh, how to deal with them, you then get to come up with responsive game plans that get your knife to work the way that you want it to work for you. Uh, so hopefully that answers that question. Are there any other questions kind of on that subject before we move on? Let's see. Sorry, there's so many, Ryan. Thank no, you for doing you're this, good, you're good. Um, there's like also private ones that people are doing, so there's multiple. But uh, quick questions on testing the sharpness. Have you seen where people place a piece of paper, fold it in half, and try to cut through it without holding the knife? Um, yeah, that's I mean, we, we can all do that. Uh, I think as, as long as the edge is, I mean, look, I, I can cut that's like crazy. tissue paper and toilet paper and ticket paper and all kinds of shit. Uh, and yes, it can tell me that my knife is really sharp, but it doesn't really tell me whether my knife will be good for kitchen use, right? The kind of edge that I might want to create to cut, I don't know, like really delicate paper, like tissue or toilet paper, uh, or shave my face is not necessarily the kind of edge that I want for what I'm doing in the kitchen. So yes, they're fun things to do. Yes, we can all like, uh, you know, chop things in midair and cut like a yeah. hair floating on water. And you know, it's just a function <laughs> of like sense. practicing sharpening a lot and making sure that your angles are extremely acute and the edge is very refined. That's how we do that kind of stuff. But okay. it's not necessarily functional for kitchen use. So just go cut food. We had right, a question else? from uh, Edon who wanted to go back to a question from earlier. And uh, he was asking if there's a specific side that you want to start with with sharpening. sharpening. He finds that there's a side that's always easier to be consistent with because the handle doesn't get in the way. You may have uh, kind of... Yeah, I, I generally start on the right side for that reason. Um, I don't know. I can't think of like any serious logical reason that you couldn't start on the other side. Yeah. Uh, the, the idea is the same, right? That you're paying attention to angles and cross-sectional geometry and all that kind of stuff. So if you start on one side versus the other, it shouldn't really make that much of a difference. But in general, right-handed people do tend to start sharpening on the right side of the blade and then move on to the left side. Um, it's, it's what I've always done. But again, I, I can't think of a compelling logical argument uh, that would say that the opposite of that is wrong. Gotcha. All right, anything else? Uh, let's see. And I, I know, by the way, that a lot of people are typing in questions. I'm, I'm happy to get to all of them if I can, as long as you guys are willing to stick around a little bit. Once we get through all this stuff, then I can spend a lot more time focused on questions or even dealing with you guys on specific issues you're having. I know some of you guys have said like, hey, I'm having an issue with this stone or I want you to see what I'm doing. We can do all that kind of stuff too. Uh, just, I want to make sure we got through like all the basic stuff for people that were interested in that as well. Yeah. So. Some of these are kind of specific. We could do them towards the end, but, uh, someone cool. bringing up, they only use 1000 stones and they keep their knife super sharp on that. Yeah. I mean, yeah, that's I fine as, as a young cook. Yeah. There's, there's nothing wrong with that. And if you just had one stone, it should be like a medium grit stone between 800 and 2000 grit, no matter what, you still need some shit to hold it in place and something to keep it flat. Right. So you still need three things at minimum, but there's nothing wrong with it. Just keep in mind that the edge from a 1000 grit stone is going to be a little bit toothier, less refined. So when you cut uh, basil, parsley, uh, you know, things that oxidize quickly like that, they'll oxidize more quickly with your edge than they would if you had a more refined edge. And when you plate ingredients uh, raw, like raw fish, raw vegetables, raw foods, the surface, the cut surface from your knife at 1000 grit is going to look a little bit more matted, a little bit more dull. 
than the cut surface from an edge that's finished at three, four, five, six, eight thousand grit. Um, and those things will be smoother, glossier, but also oxidize a little bit more slowly. But there's absolutely nothing wrong with just having a 1000 grit edge in a kitchen. In fact, uh, many people do that. So cool, as long as you're sharpening. So one quick, maybe you could just answer this later, but just put it in your mind. People have uh, asked quite a few times since we've started about uh, cutting boards on like how it, you know, kind of affects the edge of their blade and uh, like end grain versus, versus edge grain. And so yeah. maybe just keep that in Let mind. Let me get yeah. to that towards the end, but I, yeah. I actually do have a lot to say about that. So cool. cool. All right. So uh, now I want to work with you guys on Sharpie. Uh, so there's a few things that we're going to need to get this started. Uh, one is a Sharpie. Uh, if you don't have a Sharpie and you're in a professional kitchen, you're fucking up. Uh, so <laughs> you don't need one in this size necessarily, but you should always have a Sharpie on you. Uh, I like the, the Magnum extra large ones here because they're so wide. So instead of having to spend a bunch of time coloring in stuff, I can do one swipe for my edge like this, and then another swipe for the area behind the edge. So when I've colored in, and I'm just going to do this on the first side that I'm sharpening on. When I've colored it in, you can see not only is it the edge of my knife, but it's also a whole bunch of space behind it. You can see how that's all been colored in, right? So uh, let's go through the six mistakes that you can see with the Sharpie. The first one is going to be angle too high. And what angle too high looks like, I put my knife down. This is the angle that I'm normally sharpening at. So you can see how far the spine is from the stone, right? You guys can see that. When my angle is too high, it means the spine is too high relative to the stone. So as I sharpen like this, here is what happens. Let's see if we can get this to be visible for you guys. So you can see that the Sharpie gets removed just at the very edge, but doesn't go along the entire bevel. It's just right at the very edge. This is an indicator that my angle was too high. So again, when you look at my stone, you can see the spine of the knife is much higher relative to the stone surface. And the Sharpie only gets removed at the very edge of the knife. This is not what I'm going for. When I do stuff appropriately, when I sharpen at the angle that I'm supposed to be sharpening at, let me show you what that looks like. So now I've sharpened at the right, at the correct angle for this knife. And you can see that, I wish it would focus a little bit better on this. You can see that a lot more of the, uh, the edge is showing and it's a very consistent and even bevel all the way through, right? Uh, so that means that I've removed Sharpie effectively and I've been sharpening at the right angle that I want to sharpen at. So that is angle too high. Angle too low. Let's color it in again. So whenever you're coloring in your knife, it's very important that you make sure your knife is dry. Real yes. Quick. There's uh, some people with their mics still on. If we can just have it. Uh, yeah, I can just mute everyone. Give me a second. Uh, and... All right, and then Ryan, if you can unmute yourself again, since I just muted everyone all at the same time. Perfect, good to go, thank you, John. Yeah, no problem. All right, so um, make sure your knife is dry when you're doing this, Sharpie and water don't mix well. And then before you start sharpening, let it dry off for a couple of seconds. I always wave it around like an idiot here and it seems just wildly dangerous, but uh, <laughs> you know, no one's around, so I don't care. Um, whatever it is, just make sure it's dry before you start. So now we've done angle too high. And you see what that looks like at the edge with the Sharpie. And you see what it looks like when it's done correctly. Now I'm going to do angle too low. So here again, you can see I put down at the angle that I normally sharpen at. And I'm going to intentionally make a mistake of going too low. So you can see how close it gets to the stone when I do this. Are you guys all able to see that? Does it actually like show yeah. up well? It's cool. working for me, and yeah. Is the video coming through like of decent quality or is it so-so? Yeah. You have very great lighting and it's super clear. Sweet. All right. Cool, so now I'm gonna do angle too low. So here we go. So this is now angle too low. So as we get back over to this, you can see the edge of my knife is still black, but the area behind it is now shiny. This is kind of what it looks like when I'm thinning my knife, except that I just wanna do a lot more of it. Uh, but if I'm trying to sharpen the edge of my knife, I am clearly not hitting the edge at all. So when I see this kind of thing, when the spine is too close to the stone, I need to raise it up just a little bit. And I can always stop and dry off my knife and color it in again and again and again, 
throughout the course of sharpening. So like sharpen a little bit, sharpie's gone, stop, dry it off, colored in, keep going. You can continually do that kind of stuff. So you're always getting high contrast, instant visual feedback as you do stuff. So again, that's angle too low. You can see that it's still black at the edge and the area behind it is shiny. Uh, that's not what we're trying to do. So now we've gone over angle too high, angle too low. Let's make some more mistakes. Where'd I put that Sharpie? It's helpful when I keep track of stuff. There it is. All right. So I'm coloring it in once again. Angle too high, angle too low. Now, this is a tough blade to show this next one on. Let me show you this on this other blade. So now we're going to do um, under rotation and then over rotation. So here I have colored in the blade again. You can see, let it dry off. So now I'm going to show you guys under rotation. What that means is as I'm moving towards the tip, I'm lifting up appropriately, but I'm not rotating towards the spine. Tip adjustments will always be lifting up and rotating towards the spine, regardless of which side you're on. So here we go. Start sharpening, moving up towards the tip and intentionally not rotating. All right, this is tough to see, so I hope it shows up. But let me, let me try and make that a little bit cleaner and easier to see. Okay, I think that's a little bit easier. All right, so here, if it will focus on this, yeah. uh, let me put paper behind it or something so it focuses. All right. Yeah, that's great. Focus on this. Mm -hmm. All right, so as we come up towards the tip, oh shit. I don't know if you guys can see that. Yeah, there you go. All right. So as we come up towards the tip, you can see that the bevel size decreases. Are you guys able to see that? Yeah, it's a little tough, but you can see it. All right. You know what? Let's do this on an even more messed up blade that will make this easier to see. Uh, that one's not messed up enough. This should work. I'm just losing track of my Sharpie consistently. All right. Sorry that this one's a little bit tricky to see. It's all good. All right, so coming up towards the tip and under rotating. All right, this should be a lot easier to see. And let's see if this helps. Where did I put that paper? You look like me when I'm R and D, and I'm like, "Where's my, where's my knife? Where's my?" I know. Sharp? I'm like all, all over the place. <laughs> and it's like right next to me. The older I get, the yeah. the worse this shit is. And it oh, it always reminds me of those days when you're like a prep cook, and you oh, yeah. walk back to the walk-in, and There's you stand no there for like a few seconds. And you're like, "Fuck, what did I come here for?" And you walk yeah. back to the line. You instantly remember, but you still don't write this shit down. And you go back again. You're like, "Oh my god." It. Oh my gosh. <laughs> All right. So here you go. Uh, here, I think it's a little bit easier. Yeah, it's much thinner. Can you see how the bevel decreases in size as I, oh shit, there it is. As I go towards the tip, it gets smaller. Yep. All right. So when I see that, that's a sign of under rotation. That means that I'm not rotating enough towards the spine as I come up towards the tip. In order to do a more effective job, I need to make sure that I rotate uh, as much as, as possible towards the spine uh, so that the bevel comes into contact with the stone effectively. So over rotation on the flip side looks like this. So you can see the bevel now increases oh, yeah. in size as I go towards the tip, right? Mm -hmm. And that's a sign that I've rotated too far towards the tip and that is no good either. All right, so now we've done angle too high, angle too low, under rotation, over rotation. Now let's do not lifting up enough and then lifting up too much. I swear to God, I just found the Sharpie like a second ago and then I put it somewhere else again. There it is. All right. Whew. Leave it on your towel. There you go. 
All right, colored in again. Let this dry off for a second. So when I'm doing those mistakes, by the way, under rotation means that I am not rotating like this towards the spine, right? And over rotation means that I'm going too far this way, okay? So now uh, not lifting up enough. So I'm rotating, but I'm not lifting. As I do this, the tip of the knife remains black and it looks like I've just lowered the angle as I move towards the tip. Are you guys able to see that? Yeah. So that's a sign of not lifting up enough. So as I wanna fix that, I'll go through and make sure that as I rotate, I lift up a little bit. And if I do that effectively, then I get rid of all the Sharpie as I go up towards the, the tip. Like that. All right. Uh, so now lifting up too much. Uh, this one's really tricky to see in Sharpie. Uh, but the idea behind it is this. As I come up towards the tip, I'm raising my elbow way too much. You see how much I'm going up here? In reality, it should look just like this. But if I do this, I'm lifting up too much. And as I do that, what starts to happen is when I look at the tip of my knife, light is gonna start to reflect up and over like this. So I can actually see it start to curve this way. And if I do a really extreme amount of it and I look at the spine of the knife like this, I can actually see the tip bending over this way. But the biggest thing that I'll see is the light starting to reflect up and over this way. If you continue to do that, the tip of your knife just gets ground away. You no longer have a tip anymore. So it's not the easiest to see in Sharpie but it is pretty easy to see when you're looking at how light reflects. Ideally, the plane of your bevel should be flat and even all the way through. And so it should look almost mirror-like by the time you're done on a finishing stone. But even if it's not on a finishing stone, it should look flat. The way that light reflects should look the way that it reflects on a flat surface. If you're starting to see things curving, maybe you have wobble. If you see it at the tip, you're lifting up too much. And John, so, if you're lifting up the tip too much, uh, another way to kind of notice is also the sound, right? You'll have a heavier grinding sound than normal. Yeah, it actually, yeah, it makes like a kind of sharp sound. I have these in, so it's tough for you guys to hear, yeah. you know, what I hear. But uh, certainly, we want to pay attention to the way things sound. So like, for instance, if your stone starts to sound scratchy when you're sharpening on it, generally, that's a sign you need to add more water. Or when you're doing that tip adjustment with the rocking motion, you should hear like a swishing sound on your uh, edge trailing stroke. So it goes like grinding up and then swoosh, grinding up and swoosh. When you're not hearing those things, it means you're not dropping down enough. So you can pay attention to the sound of sharpening, certainly, uh, as it helps you do a better job with stuff. So I feel like we've gotten through really the basics of double bevel sharpening, the mistakes yeah. that you can make, how to recognize them and how to fix them. Um, are there any questions pertaining to what we just went over? And then if not, let's get into the other, oh, uh, for removing the Sharpie. Acetone, <laughs> there we go. Just ask that. cotton pads. I knew I brought these out for some shit. Uh, acetone is the easiest way that I've found. Uh, alcohol certainly works. Uh, you could use a rust eraser or something like that. It just causes scratching. Uh, so that's, that's no fun. And then for the makeup removing cotton pads, uh, I used to make fun of my wife for buying really fancy ones. Uh, now I understand it. The cheap ones really suck. They just yeah. fall apart. So, you know, don't skip on the, on the cotton pads, guys. Um, <laughs> And then uh, when you're doing it, you know, use, use one swipe and then fold over to a clean section, use another swipe. So you're not just spreading Sharpie around all over the place. Okay. Uh, any questions pertaining to what we just went over? And then uh, if not, let's go into all the other questions we've missed so far and see yeah. what we can do to help people out. Not for that so much. And you can go into this later, but the several people have questions, which is, is a whole nother topic. I'm sure you could talk on for a long time, but um, serrated knives and bread knives, uh, you tend to only do that, you do it on a grinder and also have a special tool for that, right? You're definitely not doing that on a regular stone. You can do it, you can do it by hand. You're gonna hate your life, but you can do it. Yeah, so um, generally grinding it out, so, right? Yeah, when, when professionals uh, do serrated knives, which I, consequently I don't do here because it's a huge pain in the ass, uh, unless you have very specialized equipment for it. Uh, the idea is that they have like a little round uh, thing grinding wheel or a slotted thing uh, and they can slowly rest the edge against that uh, and grind in those serrations. But when you do the stuff at home, let me go grab a bread knife. Give me a second.
All right. So when you're doing this stuff at home, you can see how all of these serrations look over here, right? Mm -hmm. What you would be doing again is coloring in those serrations with Sharpie. And then you go to the hardware store and you get some sandpaper and some dowel rods that fit, or at least a dowel rod that fits into that groove effectively. Uh, maybe like the tiniest bit undersized. The idea is that you're gonna take the dowel rod and wrap it in the sandpaper. Uh, and then that should fit perfectly into those grooves. And at an angle, let's just do this shit with a pen for a second. At an angle like this, following the kind of bevel angle that's already on there with the sandpaper on the dowel rod, we would sharpen each one of those things until the point comes back nicely and we formed a burr that's even and consistent on the backside. And then on a stone or on like a belt grinder, buffing wheel, something like that, we would deburr the backside. Uh, and, and that's it. And so just imagine that as you sit there and you're doing, just think about how time consuming that is. Uh, yeah. to do that by hand. So you can do it. It's, it's certainly possible. Uh, you're just gonna, you know, hate your life a bit, a little bit. What's up, Sachiko? I see you there. <laughs> Hope you're doing well. All right. Um, so does that answer the uh, serrated question for you guys? Yeah, I think unless it's super sentimental or uh, very expensive, when it's completely dead, sometimes you just... Yeah, maybe it's time to like get a new one. Yeah. Yeah, it, it, it sucks to say like, hey, just you know, waste stuff like that. And consequently, you don't have to waste it entirely. Like you could take that and turn it into a slicer. You, you know, could. you could just get rid of the serrations. Like there's stuff you can do. So I'm, I'm not ever advocating just like trashing shit because it's not useful to you right now. Uh, even when your knives break, uh, you know, you can repurpose those things. Like I've seen someone's knife break in half and we turn the front part into like a paring knife for him, Yeah. you know? Um, so you don't, you don't have to throw stuff away, but you might still want to get another bread knife. Um, real quick, I think it would be a quick answer to this, but some people, someone had a question about um, if you have a different approach for like very thin, flexible knives, boning, fillet knives on sharpening. It's you know, not necessarily a different approach, but uh, you just have to be more cognizant about what's going on. So part of the issue that you'll run into with thin, flexible knives is that when you're off plane, so like, this is actually pretty flexible. So it's a, a good example of this, uh, even though it's a bread knife. Uh, when, when you are lifting up or applying downward pressure with this hand that's supposed to be holding the handle, you're not gonna get consistent or even pressure uh, over the surface of your stone. So it's very important that this hand stays planar with the surface of the stone. You're not applying downward or upward pressure and that this hand stays over the center of the stone. And again, is applying firm, but not heavy pressure here. Cause you don't want sh stuff to flex underneath your fingers. So, you know, make, making sure that everything is planar and just controlling how much pressure you're applying is just more important that way. Uh, and the same for the tip, it's just going to require lighter pressure so that you're not having the blade flex under you as you do that kind of stuff. Hey, John, go ahead. I'm going to step away for like one minute. I'll be back and just continue. Your... Cool. So uh, let me talk about cutting boards uh, for a second, since I know that that was one of the questions that a lot of people had. Uh, there are a few kinds of cutting boards that I think are great um, and some that are like, okay. And then some that are like absolute trash. So let's start with the stuff that is absolute trash. Don't cut on glass. Don't cut on metal. Don't cut on quartz or marble uh, or any kind of like absurdly hard thing. It's going to mess up your knife. Your knife is going to chip a little bit more frequently and it's certainly going to dull faster. Um, so let's not do that. Um, in terms of cutting boards, we often encounter uh, for professional cooks, most, most of us will see like hard poly boards at work, uh, whether they're colored or white or whatever. Uh, they tend to be relatively hard. They're common, they're inexpensive. They're not the best boards for your knives, but they are the boards that you will probably end up using the most often. Um, the harder the boards are like that, the, the more difficult it is to use really thin and really hard knives on them without having as many chipping issues. Um, and so in general, the boards that work best tend to be on the softer side of things. So of boards that I really like, uh, end grain wood cutting boards. That means the, the grain is running vertically through the board. In fact, let me go grab one. I'll be right back. Show you guys what that looks like really quick. Give me one second. Whoa. All right. So end grain wood cutting boards. So this is an end grain wood cutting board. And you can see that you can, you can actually see the grain of the wood uh, runs this way through the board. Uh, 
What's nice about end grain wood cutting boards is that when you cut on them, you're cutting kind of through fibers as opposed to across fibers. Uh, and so it's a little bit nicer on your knife's edge. It wicks away moisture from the surface. Uh, so it actually tends to be a little bit sanitary, uh, more sanitary than cross grain. Uh, and the cuts kind of self heal a little bit over time. Not all of them, but a lot of them, but they're expensive and they require a little bit more care and maintenance in the sense that they need to be continually oiled as do all wood boards. Um, I like to use a mixture of beeswax and mineral oil, but anytime it starts to look or feel dry, kind of like wall handles or sayas, you wanna give them a little bit of oil. Mineral, mineral oil works just by itself. I mix again, mineral oil and beeswax because it ends up being a paste like this, that's just a little bit easier to work with. You can use boiled linseed oil. I just wanna make sure that what you're using is food safe. And uh, I, I like to avoid things that harden a lot uh, since they tend to mess with the texture or, or feeling of the surface of the, the like handles or size when I use that kind of stuff. So end grade wood cutting boards, maple, walnut, cherry, mahogany, things that create foods that you would eat. Avoid teak, it's high in silica content, um, so yeah. High soft boards, they look like poly boards, but they're much softer. They're created from polyvinyl acetate. Uh, they are, they're my favorite synthetic boards to use. They're very soft, very forgiving, but the knife does stick in the surface a little bit more. Uh, they get scratched up a little more easily and they're temperature sensitive. So you can't put them in the dishwasher. In fact, they have, I think a range from negative 20 degrees to like 70 degrees Celsius, something like that. So not even the level of boiling water. Uh, but they're extremely nice to cut on and foods don't slide around on them. So end grain wood cutting boards, high soft boards, uh, rubber gum boards like Sanitoff or Asahi. Uh, they're similar in density to wood, uh, less temperature sensitive than, than high soft, but not quite as soft. Uh, those, those work quite well. Uh, Hiba or Hinoki birds are, uh, boards are a kind of cross grain, really soft wood from Japan. They also require a little bit more care. They need to be wet before you use them. Uh, they need to be flipped over so they're not warping. Um, and they do uh, scar up pretty easily. So they might need to be sanded over time. And then other cross grain boards can work as well. They're just not as nice as end grain boards, but they're still nicer than the, the poly boards that you'll see. Um, those are the main cutting boards I would use. Uh, and the thinner and harder, more delicate your knife is, the more I'd pay attention to getting a higher end board. The more tough and durable your stuff is, the, the less you have to worry about that. And if you're in a professional environment where you don't have an option about what you use, just know that if you have something that's really thin and hard, you're gonna to need to be a little bit more careful with respect to how you cut uh, and, and just not being rough on your, on your cutting board. So that hopefully should answer uh, about cutting boards. And then uh, what's next? You back, Brian? I'm back, how's it going? All right, uh, what, what do we have next up after Let's cutting see. boards? Question, someone, did you uh, get to the type of wood when I was gone on the cutting boards? Yeah, I, I talked about uh, different wood types and what kinds of cutting boards work well. Someone was and, asking and about also bamboo. what to avoid. Your thoughts yeah, on bamboo? Yeah, so uh, I, I didn't talk about bamboo. Bamboo is okay. Uh, it's not the greatest. Um, just there's a lot of small pieces. There's a lot of glue that goes in between those pieces, and it's not as soft or forgiving as some other things. It also tends to be cross grain, but it's certainly better than like the hard poly boards that you see at work. So you know if the if the best ones that you see are the end grain wood boards and the the high soft. Uh, and then kind of the mid-level stuff would be the cross grain and, and, and uh, that kind of stuff. Uh, it would be more in that range, but it's not as bad as like the, the hard poly boards or then, you know, cutting on glass metal, stuff like that. Um, so middle, middle of the road, I guess, is the answer for, for bamboo. All right, what's next? Looks like you, uh, you've hit most of the questions unless I roll up to way up in the beginning. So if someone has a specific question that you haven't hit yet, they can yeah. just... Uh, like shoot now. Yeah. If there are questions that you guys have now, uh, you know, if you put like Q or something like that in the chat, I'm going to switch over to this other side over here so I can actually access stuff a little bit more easily. Um, if you, if you either put like Q in the chat or something like that, and I can unmute you, uh, you or type the question there. All right. Um, okay. So I'm just going to go from the first one that I see, which is, is the sharpening method the same for Chinese cleavers that have a slight rocker in the edge? Yeah, technically it's the same. Uh, it's just that your tip adjustment, lifting up and rotating back towards the spine starts a little bit sooner because that curve begins a little bit sooner in the blade. Uh, and as you come back towards the heel of the knife, you might need to actually lower the handle a little bit and rotate again towards the spine uh, to follow that curve a little bit more effectively. They're not huge adjustments, but they are uh, small adjustments that need to be made. 
Uh, so the next question is, do they tend to warp more than others since my, uh, Isaac, are you talking about bamboo boards or what kind of boards are you talking about when you ask, do they warp, warp more than others? Bamboo, sorry. I don't know, I don't use bamboo boards that much. Uh, if, if you are seeing them warp, um, maybe you're leaving the bottom side in water. So it's helpful to put like a, a paper towel or something underneath it. But also when you dry it, dry it on the side so it, it uh, you know, drains effectively. Uh, and if you can, if it's a double side board, use both sides of it. So alternate the sides that you use so you can uh, avoid the warping. Um, end grain wood cutting boards can also warp. Uh, it's just not as common. Cross grain tends to warp a little bit more. Uh, high soft boards do warp. So I try and flip them over and use both sides of them. Uh, so uh, any tips for refinishing factory finished knives with convex grinds? I have a Mazaki Yuto with a convex grind. So the way that people are making uh, some convex grinds differs. Uh, in, in the case of hand finished convex grinds, um, they're, they're what we call like a hamaguri edge. Uh, and they tend to be like a two part bevel that's, that's blended together. And I'll show you that in a second. Um, in the case of non hand finished things, it's generally done either on a wheel or a belt grinder. So unless you have something like that, uh, you know, you're not going to be able to do exactly what was done there. However, there is no reason that you can't create a similar kind of edge. Uh, using stones. Uh, there are going to be in high spots and low spots, no matter what you do. Uh, you don't have to flatten the bevel entirely as you do that, uh, but you can still get rid of high and low spots while uh, creating a hamaguri edge. So let me show you really quick. I'm going to flip the camera back this way. I'm going to show you what hamaguri edges could look like as you do this kind of stuff. I think a lot of people misunderstand how convex things actually need to be. And the reality is not that much. Uh, if something is so visibly convex that you look at it and already looks like it's, uh, you know, light is rolling over the edge this way, it's way too much. Uh, realistically, it should be so subtle that unless you have a kind of straight edge that you can put against it, uh, you shouldn't be able to tell. So the way that it's done is predominantly through finger placement. Uh, in this one, kind of like the Mazaki Gyuto you talk about, there's a Shinogi line. Uh, the Mazaki one's not as clear or crisp of a Shinogi line in general, but you can still do the same kind of thing. What you'll do is you'll put the knife down on the stone and you'll apply pressure directly over the shinogi line. You'll find that part where it starts to rock. And then you wanna move your fingers just the tiniest bit in front of that towards the edge uh, so that your pressure is down against the stone and pushing back up against the shinogi line. And as you sharpen, you're gonna sharpen all along that area, trying to push the shinogi line up a little bit. So uh, let's see if I can show this effectively on here. So as I'm doing this, I'm sharpening from here down to maybe like halfway or one third of the way up the blade. Um, so that's what I'm trying to do in my first part. So I'm moving the Shinogi line up. Then I'm gonna move my fingers from that area down closer to the edge. I'm not lifting up or adjusting the angle here, but I am adjusting my pressure. So initially my pressure was down and towards the Shinogi line. Now my pressure as my fingers move close to the edge is down and towards the edge. And that finger placement adjustment and how I'm applying pressure using this hand, not to change the angle, but to apply pressure towards the edge will take care of the kind of angle adjustment that I need to do. So then I'll sharpen the edge that way. And then I can go through that coarse, medium. And on the finishing stone, if I so choose, it should already look pretty consistent because the angle change isn't so different. I can find the space in between those two bevels and rock lightly to blend them together. Um, it's gonna be tough to create a really beautiful looking Kasumi finish that way. Uh, on a hard stone, like what you're trying to do. Uh, and it's part of the reason that a lot of people that are doing really cool polishing tend to do so on flat bevels. So they tend to flatten out their bevels quite a bit because their goal is not about like what, what the most functional edge is, but rather about like how far they can push things in terms of thinness and then getting stuff to look really pretty. So keep in mind that looking pretty and being functional don't necessarily have to be the same thing. Um, in my experience, creating a really nice looking finish uh, is best done where you work all the way up through your progression to your finishing stone. Uh, and then once you have close to where you wanna be, you can go through with a little finger stone and touch up uh, you know, the parts that don't look quite as, as even. Uh, so that's probably the way that you'll have to deal with what you're doing. And the type of edge is called hamaguri. Uh, and if, if you would like later on some help, 
you know, with that a little bit more specifically, I'm happy to do that. But you're going to have to deal with high and low spots. Uh, and just make sure that by moving your fingers and adjusting where you're doing and using Sharpie to color in, you can see, hey, I'm hitting the Shinoyu land. Hey, I'm hitting the edge. It's not flat all the way through. Uh, so you can, you can check that kind of stuff. All right. Uh, next question down. Do you change pressure, whether it's edge trailing or edge leading strokes? Uh, in general, my pressure uh, in sharpening double bevel knives is on the edge trailing stroke, regardless of size or uh, side rather uh, that I'm sharpening on. So uh, it's I'm, I'm relaxed on my edge leading stroke and I apply pressure on my edge trailing stroke. Um, Rose says her computer is dying and bye. All right, cool. Um, blah, blah, blah. Do you have tips on putting convex bevels on double beveled knives? Um, man, if, if it's a wide bevel knife, you can do what I just talked about with the, the hamagri kind of sharpening like that. Uh, if it's not a wide bevel knife and you want to convex the, the entire blade, you're probably gonna have to do that on something like a belt grinder. But if you don't have powered equipment, you can use a mouse pad and sandpaper and it has a little bit more give to it. So it's possible to follow convex grinds a little bit more easily that way. And you can use a slight rocking motion as you, as you do that. Um, yeah, but in, unless it's a wide bevel knife, the kind of single bevel hamagiri technique isn't, isn't going to transfer. If it is a wide bevel knife, then yes, it looks like you're doing a single bevel knife with the hamagiri edge just on both sides. Uh, and generally, because you're doing that at more acute angles, those are the kinds of knives that tend to work best for micro bevels, for instance. Uh, so yeah. Um, all right. Blah, blah, blah. All right, the Mazaki isn't crisp at all, but the Shinogi line is still visible because of the KU. So a lot of times when, when makers are making things, and this, is, this isn't this is just specifically about Mazaki, but this is just a, a more general kind of thing. In wide bevel knives, most of the people that are making them aren't grinding them by hand on stones. So the bevels are rarely flat or rarely well done. In general, it will come off of like a, a grinding wheel, buffer, something like that. Uh, and then through a series of whatever the, that particular craftsman does, they make it look really pretty. And that can be uh, sandblasting is, is really common or bead blasting. Uh, in the South, in Kochi, they use this kind of like uh, wire brush wheel with, with mud that creates a really nice, I probably have something like that here, actually. Um, let's see. So like this. This is what that looks like with the wire brush and the mud. Um, so that's one way to do it. Uh, in Sakai, people tend to use uh, abrasives like emery, something like that, to create uh, edge parallel scratches. And then they go through and have muds, generally uh, from natural stones that they mix together and everyone has their own proprietary mix. And they use that with like rubber or wood or metal uh, to create those kind of misty finishes. But it's not done on, on stones. Uh, and so a lot of people here see those things and they think like, hey, they're doing this shit on natural stones. I have to buy natural stones to, to copy what they're doing. You can get close. You can make things look reasonably similar, uh, but unless you're doing exactly what they're doing, it's not going to look exactly the, the same. Um, so uh, to answer your question, though, the, because the Mazaki Shinogi isn't crisp, yeah, you still want to feel out for where it starts to rock over. So you apply pressure kind of edging towards that uh, kind of Shinogi line. Uh, and see where it starts to tilt over. And then once you find that, just back off the tiniest bit from that towards the edge so that you can apply downward pressure towards the stone and backwards pressure pushing the Shinogi line up a little bit. Uh, so it should be just the same. Uh, the next one from Ali, how do you fix the tip of a knife that you have completely tipped off? I'm gonna unplug this from power and I'm gonna show you how to do this in my grinding room. So give me a second. Let's go Let's fuck up a knife and then fix it. Um, <laughs> mm -mm. All right, so uh, I don't know how I'm gonna place this, let's see here. All right, so here is our knife. Let's break off the tip uh, with a hammer maybe. Ah. Oh yeah. Now we're missing a tip. Cool. <laughs> so this is the edge of my knife on this side. This is the spine of my knife on this side. What I want to do to fix this is I want to grind along the spine of the knife, reshaping the tip. So let's see if I can position this thing. Sorry, my grinding room is not ideally set up for this. That's fair. But we're going to see if we can make this work. Uh, uh, 
laptop's gonna fall and I'm gonna cry. <laughs> Shit. Um, okay, that looks like somewhat precariously balanced. This is so dangerous. Okay, spin my wheel up. So again, you can do this on a sharpening stone. That's totally gonna fall. It's not gonna work. I'm sorry, guys. I'm gonna have you down here for a second. So you can do this on a sharpening stone too, but what I'm gonna be doing is grinding here along the spine. So I'm gonna put this down here. Let's see if I can hold this in one hand. Can you guys see? Yep. All right. So again, the spine of my knife, and I'm starting decently far back and then just slowly lifting up as I go. And then coming back down and just trying to create like a smooth pitch shape. So I don't want it to look like a tonto piece. So if I lift up too much, it starts to look kind of snub nosed at the, at the very tip. And when all is said and done, I have a tip back. So the, the answer is that when you do this kind of stuff, you're grinding in from the spine of the knife. Uh, to repair the tip. And then when you're done, if you want, you can go through with sandpaper and, uh, and refinish it and make it look nice. I have this big wheel and then I have a scotch bright uh, belt that helps me go through and, and refinish stuff nicely. Uh, and that's the, the main process that I do stuff for. So again, uh, repairing from the spine as opposed to from the edge. There might be some extreme broken tip cases where I have to do a little bit of edge repair. But as soon as I start to touch the edge of my knife, my knife is getting thicker cross-sectionally because I'm removing metal from the edge. So that tip area that I'm repairing then needs to be thinned and then of course refinished because it looks like shit after I've thinned it. Uh, so repairing from the spine alleviates a lot of those kinds of issues. Uh, you don't have to sharpen the edge when you're done with it at all. Uh, it's actually one of the easiest fixes to do. Um, There's not gonna be much of a secret anymore because I'm about to say it here and this is on YouTube, but usually when people come in, I don't even charge for that. Like if, if you have a broken tip, it's so easy. Like if it took me more than 10, 15 seconds to fix, I would be surprised. Uh, so if you're in LA and you're freaking out about a broken tip, come and bug me. It's, it's really easy to do. Uh, if you're doing it on your stones, you want a really coarse stone, as coarse as you can get, or you can get some wet, dry sandpaper. Uh, I use the side of my stone as instead of the top of the stone, because I want to preserve how flat the stone is and the side. I don't really care about that much. Um, but that's, that's the gist of it with that. So, um, could someone, yes. if they didn't have a lot of different stones or a lot of, you know, access to have you go fix it, could they just use like your fixing stone, like your diamond plate or your course? Yeah. You can, uh, okay. So I wouldn't recommend the diamond fast. flattening plates. Um, the, the way that most diamond flattening plates are made is that they uh, electrically plate diamonds onto one side of it. And it's usually a pretty thin uh, layer of diamonds and they come off really easily when you sharpen on them. Uh, so it decreases the life of your flattening plate significantly. But if you have a really coarse stone, the, the sidewalk, yeah. um, you know, something else like that, that would be better. But you could use, you could use the diamond stuff. Just understand that you're sacrificing the overall life of your diamond flattening plate a little bit in doing so. Uh, so, um, all right, Elijah says, any alternatives if there's no finger stones? There are some synthetic stones, and I guess this answers the next question uh, as well. There are some synthetic stones that do a decent job at creating contrast. They don't look as nice as natural stones do. Uh, but for instance, um, what are some good ones? Uh, so we have one called the Ginzo Alto. Uh, it's a medium grit stone. It's very soft, dishes quickly, but it creates really nice, really simple contrast. Um, what are some other ones? Naniwa makes a big red brick, the like Ebi 1000, it's soft. That does a pretty good job at creating uh, nice Kasumi finishes. Um, you say the green brick? The... Yeah, not that one. Oh, I, not brick. that one. <laughs> that one yeah. That one will create that kind of like streaky, semi-mirror, odd-looking thing. Yeah. Um, but they have a big red one that's a little bit red. coarser than that that's pretty cool. The King 800 does a pretty good job at that. Um, it's just not as, as pretty. But uh, you can go through and use like a metal polish afterwards, like semi-chrome uh, is one of my favorites. Blitz also works well, and it will like clean it up and brighten it up a bit. Uh, and there are a number of ways that you can cheat, right? So like you could go through and sharpen everything up to like a beautiful mirror polish, and then use some of the mud from your 800 grit stone and like a wine cork or something like that to, to create a little bit more of that contrast. There are a number of ways you can go about it. Uh, just for like the sake of ease, finger stones are, are really, really easy to do that with. 
Um, and so it's, it's often when people are looking to get like high, high level finishes, like things that look really nice, I'll tell them just use synthetic stones up until everything's like almost a mirror, looks even and consistent. And then just go through and, and use like a Uchigamori Hazia is a, a type of like soft uh, Uchigamori finger stone. It works really well to put contrast on. It's, it's very simple and easy. But yes, the like Geshen Jinzo Auto, uh, King 800, uh, stones like this are synthetic stones. They tend to be more medium grit um, since a, a lot of it is just getting light to reflect differently and coarser scratches do that better. Uh, depending on the steel and, and stone, I don't know, uh, symbiosis, how, how well they work together, uh, you can sometimes get certain stones to leave really nice kusumi finishes on certain knives, but it's just not consistent from, from knife to knife. So like, for example, I have like 50 something Yanagiba uh, on some of them, on some of the white number two ones that I have that are from one particular blacksmith shop, uh, the Suehiro Rika 5000 does a really nice job at creating kusumi finishes on, but from like another blacksmith, it looks like shit. So, uh, you know, you, you got to test some stuff out and see. Um, all right, so just going tip fixture is a good question. Uh, okay, I, I got that one that's covering from the, the spine. Any tips for smoothing out a choil or spine? I use a belt grinder, certainly makes my life easier. Uh, if you want to do it at home, uh, you can cut strips of uh, sandpaper uh, and get a phone book. And what you'll do is you'll, with the phone book between your knees, a, I don't know how I'm going to show this. So you'll like clamp the phone book between your knees with the knife in it um, and with the, the choil just up a little bit. And then you'll kind of like shimmy over it to, to smooth all that stuff out. And you can do the same thing for the spine, just shimmying over it that way. If you have a vice that you can clamp stuff in, just want to make sure you're being safe and secure with that kind of stuff. The, the things that are important to me when I do it on the belt grinder is like, say the spine initially looks like this. The first thing I want to do is cut off like that that corner so instead of being like this now all of a sudden it starts to look like this it has like those those my hands just aren't doing what i want them to do it's so weird when you look at like a mirror image of yourself yeah. all right so instead of being like this i have like a flat spot on top and then these kind of two bevels on the side and then once i have that then rounding it over helps create a nicer radius overall uh and i can do the same thing for the the choil as well um that's that's probably the easiest way uh, to, to do that kind of stuff. And then you can, you can go up in grits if you want to whatever you want. So like when I do it, uh, we use a 220 grit belt and then we clean it up with a medium scotch bright. And then if people want it mirror polished, I have like a, a green compound on my buffer. We just go through and, and polish it up and it looks nice and uh, mirror like. Um, all right. And then Kyle says, let's get me an REM90 to key light me. Yeah, because <laughs> I need more lights over here. Um, we have tons of space. You can, you can tell that it's not like packed behind me at all. All right, um, blah, blah, blah. Uh, just to follow up to the handle and board care, what ratio of mineral oil to beeswax? So I use a one to three or one to four ratio, one part beeswax, three to four parts mineral oil. I do that by uh, weight, I measure in grams. Um, and so what I'll do is I'll measure out, usually I'll start at one to three because I like things to set in a little bit more and not be so goopy. Um, and I'll, I'll measure them out. And then in like a double boiler, uh, I'll heat all of it up until the wax melts and I mix it all together and then pour it into mason jars, stores for a long time. And you just need like a tiny bit on your fingertips, rub it in, uh, let it sit for a second, wipe off the excess, call it a day. So anytime the wood starts to look or feel a little bit dry, whether it's your cutting board, your saya, your handle, your cabinets at home, some other shit, uh, it all works the same way. And you can buy this stuff already done, like booze board sells it, other people sell it. It's the same. It's beeswax, mineral oil, and sometimes like an essential oil, like orange blossom oil or something to, to smell good. We, we make it here too, uh, for the people that are too lazy to make it on their own. Uh, <laughs> certainly it's, it's here. It's like little $4 tins of, of it, uh, but you can, you can make it on your own. It's not so difficult. Um, one to four is fine too. It's just a little bit looser. One to three sets in a little bit harder. Uh, and, and it's not that that's the only way to do stuff. You just play around with it, see what works best for you. Um, are you best off purchasing finger stones or just making them yourself? Any resource on how to do it? My friend Maxim has a website called JapaneseNaturalStones.com and he has a great Wikipedia thing that goes over using finger stones, how to make them, all kinds of stuff like that. Uh, I think that's an excellent resource. I buy them. I have a natural stone vendor that I deal with for some of our natural stones here. 
uh, and he's able to source really, really nice ones for me. So I don't have to deal with breaking them down myself and I don't have to deal with grading them or sorting them out. He does all that for me. I have them, I sell them. Unfortunately, they're expensive. I don't have them up on the website because I don't always have a ton of them in stock. Uh, and they are unfortunately really expensive for me. Uh, but they're like the same quality ones that are being used by, you know, sword polishers and other people like that in Japan. You can make your own too. It's certainly more cost effective. Uh, you just have to figure out how much time and effort you want to put into stuff. Um, and, and you can do that not just out of Uchigamori. You can do that out of a ton of natural stones. Just see what works for you. Play around with it. There's no single right way. Uh, what matters is you understand fundamental concepts. You, you have an ability to, to try things and critically think and problem solve. Uh, and so there's nothing stopping you from taking a synthetic stone and turning them into finger stones or another natural stone and turning into finger stones. Just see what creates the kind of results that you're looking for. All right. Um, question, not about sharpening. Uh, can you somehow quantify or compare exactly how chippy Heiji's Iwasaki steel is compared to hard Shogami number two? It's like, it depends on how hard the, the white number two is, but of all knives that I have used, Heiji is like on the more brittle side of stuff. And that's both for his carbon steel and semi-stainless. And it's a function of how he approaches heat treating and grinding. Uh, he grinds to a very, very, very thin edge, even though the knives are a little bit thicker in the midsection. Uh, and then he heat treats really, really hard. Um, what else is brittle in that way? Like uh, it's Kasa Hinora-san's knives uh, are on the brittle side. So let's just take a, a range of things. Let's say one to 10, one is like a portioner you know, beastly, tough and durable, nothing gets messed up. And uh, 10 is like the most brittle thing you could possibly imagine. Like try uh, cutting food with a straight razor and see if the edge doesn't get messed up, all right? So that's our scale of one to 10. Uh, we'll say that like a five would be like a Mac knife, something like that, right? Uh, maybe a Shun would be like a five and a half, six. Uh, the Ginga stuff might be like a seven. And when you start to get into some of the harder Yanagibas, you're looking at like seven and a half, eight. Uh, Heiji stuff is like eight and a half, nine. So it's not as brittle as like trying to cut with the straight razor, but it's, it's certainly brittle. So that's, that's an example where a micro bevel could be helpful, uh, could make things a little bit easier for you. Um, yeah, all right. Uh, but I will also say that his Iwasaki, the carbon steel from Heiji, takes a, a much crisper, nicer edge than almost any white number two I've ever tried. The, uh, there are a few people whose knives maybe are on the more rustic side and it's not always stuff that I, I personally enjoy, but their heat treatment of certain things is phenomenal. Uh, Heiji's heat treatment of steels is phenomenal. The knives are ground a little bit more rustic. You know, they're a little bit thicker in the midsection. It's not always as consistent, but the steel is phenomenal. Uh, Fujiwara Teriyasu. Uh, the, the grinds are wildly inconsistent. Fit and finish is wildly inconsistent. The steel is amazing. Like it's so fun to sharpen. It takes such a nice edge. Uh, it's, it's great. So, um, all right. Is there any way to improve food release on thin, thin gutos or just let's say thin knives like the Ikazuchi or Geshen Ginga? I'm just adding to that question. The thinner the knives are, the less good the food release will be in general. Uh, and the benefit that you get from that is that they move through food really easily. So as you can imagine, because something is really thin like this, there's not as much room for convexing or wide bevel kind of geometry that would generally promote food being pushed up and away from the blade, but there's less force required to move through things. In order to gain better food release, you make sacrifices in cross-sectional geometry. So wide bevel knives will never cut as good as knives that are ground you know, thin and convex all the way from the spine to the edge. They just won't, it's not, it's not possible. They will have better food release and you can get good cutting performance out of them. Uh, so in terms of improving, improving the food release, uh, you would have to sacrifice a little bit in blade height uh, to be able to create a slightly thicker area behind the edge that you could then create either some kind of like wide bevel situation or a more pronounced convex grind from the spine to the edge. Uh, but you can't add metal back onto it. So no, it's, it's the, the price you pay for ease of cutting tall, dense foods uh, is that food sticks a little bit more to the side. Technique, cutting technique matters a lot though keeping the blade moistened. So like, you know, when you're cutting, you have a damp towel in the lower hand corner of your board, wiping off on that periodically keeps the blade moistened. Uh, when you notice food stick a lot, you can do like a tip draw through kind of cut. Uh, so there are different kinds of cutting techniques that you can do to alleviate sticking, uh, but you can't change the blade so much uh, in, in that regard. Um, da -da -da, your Reddit fans would enjoy hearing more of your thoughts on Fujiwara Teriyasu if you have to share it as well. 
I don't, I don't want this to be anything about me, you know, saying negative things about stuff. Uh, Fujiwara Teriyasu's blades, uh, we used to carry them. Uh, and we carried them because I liked, I liked the steel. Um, and, and I thought they were great. And there are many knives that he makes that are phenomenal, They're like great cutters. But the consistency of grind from knife to knife uh, just wasn't where I wanted it to be personally. It's not that it's objectively bad or good. There are many people that sell them. It just wasn't, it wasn't what I liked quite as much. Uh, I just, I like the, the steel, the heat treatment. Um, and the, the Dalva stuff, I've, I've sharpened a few of them. I haven't seen enough to really have any kind of solid form opinion. I don't sell them. I don't think it's particularly fair for me to, to talk about something that my competitors sell uh, in any way that would be either positive or negative, but it would affect them. It doesn't affect me. So I, I apologize. I'm going to skip on that stuff. Um, Cool. I feel like I got to all the questions at the end over there. Uh, I'm sure I missed some in the beginning, uh, but if, if there are any other questions or if there's any specific things you guys are looking for, let me know. Otherwise, I guess we can get it wrapped up. What's up, Brian? Did you say something? You seem to touch on almost all the stuff in the beginning, the questions that were a little, you know, kind of, I don't know, had more detail that didn't make sense for the beginning. You kind of touched through your your explanation and by uh, showing everyone how to sharpen, you kind of hit all those points. Okay, I see, thank you. Uh, and really, thank you so much for your help also, by the way, in keeping this stuff organized. Uh, I can't tell you how much I appreciate it. Um, I see a couple of questions that just popped up at the bottom over here. Uh, how long can you use a towel to wipe down your knife or cutting board before it's disgusting? Uh, depends on what you're cutting. Uh, Cross-contamination, you want to avoid as much as possible. So like if you're cutting onions, and you have one towel for your onions, as long as it's relatively clean and you're still cutting the same onions, cool. When you're not cutting the onions anymore, I hope you're cleaning off your cutting board and your knife and getting rid of that towel and putting a new one. So you can use paper towels for that. They're a little bit more disposable, but uh, you know, just avoid cross-contamination. Anything, things, anything, anytime that things start to look dirty, clean them. I mean, food, food, Food is such a dangerous thing if we're not careful about our sanitation. And so better, better safe than sorry uh, is, is my answer to that. Um, it's always, good to always, uh, you know, always wipe your board, your knives, and just change everything between any projects, right? Even if yeah. it's- Even, even, even just ingredient dirt, changes. Like wipe your knife between rosemary and sage and wipe your board. And wash your hands. Yeah. You know, All, always. It's like this, this whole washing your hand thing with coronavirus cracks me up a little bit because as cooks, we're all so familiar with washing our hands. We all even know that there are skin diseases that you can get from washing your hands too much. Like our hands are messed up. They are dry and they peel. And it's, it's just because we wash them all the time. So just wash your hands a lot along with everything else. And when you wash your knife, your cutting board, use soap, use hot water. It's not going to mess stuff up. Uh, on end grain wood cutting boards or wood cutting boards that you're, you're uh, oiling, the soap will leach out a little bit of the oil. So it might require oiling a little bit more frequently. But uh, using soap and and you know, water is not going to mess up your knife at all. Uh, if you have a carbon steel knife, you want to make sure it's clean and dry when you're done. Uh, I, I didn't touch on carbon steel stuff. I don't know if you guys um, want me to go over that kind of stuff, but I can go over, you know, carbon steel care and maintenance. Uh, I am still working down the questions here. Uh, so it says maybe show real quick the switching hands method. Uh, so let's switch this back around and see if I can show you guys the switching hands. And then you guys can see how poor I am at sharpening with my left hand. It's lower yeah, it's a little bit. Tough for me as well. It sucks, man. I, and like, I do it a lot. So I have like a decent bit of practice. I just am functionally slow with the left side of my body. Like it's, it's not, even when I'm fighting, like my, my, my left jab sucks. My left kick suck. Like <laughs> everything sucks on the left side of my body. Um, all right. So as, as we go through stuff, I'd be sharpening here. I go through all of my sharpening. And then I'm starting from a pinch grip here, index finger to the spine, thumb down towards the heel. I shift my body. So initially my feet are placed like this. Now my feet are placed like this. And then it's the same, straight forward, straight back. I can't crawl my fingers this way. Like on the left side, I actually have to you know, do a little bit of sharpening and then stop and then move my fingers. It's, it's much more difficult for me to crawl them as I do stuff. I tuck my arm inside again for the tip adjustment, but you can do that outswing if you want. It's just for me, again, a little bit easier to just deal with this forearm rotation. Um, but that's, that's it. 
it's it's the same. So one side would be like this, the other side would be like this. I'm switching my body orientation and and my grips, but they essentially mirror each other. And that's that's the only difference. And then for the end, when you're stropping, I I don't know if it's economical in, in terms of time to do this and then switch and do this. So I, I think in those cases, I still tend to do it just with one hand uh, from a function of, I guess, economy of motion and, and time. Uh, but that's that's essentially what it looks like as, as we switch hands. So, so let's come back to the little chat room thing here. Okay. Um, when sharpening Deba, is it necessary to totally grind out the high and low spots uh, or how to deal with the back if it isn't perfectly flat? There, there are two, three, three things that I want to get to with that. So first of all, um, your question doesn't just apply to Deba, it applies to all single bevel knives. Uh, and the answer is no, it is not necessary to grind out any high and low spots unless they are at the edge of the knife. So if you see that there is a low spot or a high spot that directly connects to or touches the edge of the knife, that's one you want to deal with because it's going to affect your ability to actually sharpen the edge of the knife. But if it's like in the middle of the bevel uh, or closer to the Shinogi line uh, and it aesthetically doesn't bother you, you don't, have to, you don't have to worry about it at all. You can work it out over time. If it bothers you, you can do something about it, but it's not necessary. Um, and then how to deal with the back if it isn't perfectly flat. Most, the vast majority of single bevel knives backsides have like a slight upsweep as you go towards the tip. Um, and so even though the blade itself might be straight and the edge might be straight, you'll notice that the back still requires you to lift your hand up the tiniest bit. It shouldn't be that much, but it brings up a really important point, uh, which is before we begin any sharpening, one of the first things that we realistically should be doing, but I, I recognize that most people either can't or won't or don't want to do is checking blade straightness. If your blade isn't straight when you start sharpening, anything you do in your sharpening is gonna exacerbate that issue. So uh, let me show you how to assess blade straightness um, in terms of bending and warping. And then I can also show you uh, some basic ways that we fix some of those things. And I can explain more complex ways that we fix those things as well. I would just caution you to uh, that, that any of these repairs that we're doing could cause serious and significant damage to your knife. So if you're not really comfortable with it, maybe don't do that shit. Uh, but if, if you want to give it a shot, uh, at least you'll know how it works. So let me go grab a knife and then let's talk about straightness. Mm -hmm. Let's use this one. All right. So there are two main kinds of straightness that I want to deal with. One is bending. And by bending, I just mean like this or like this, right? So like the blade might be bent here or might be bent this way. And the other one is warping or twisting. And so that's when the blade twists, you know, like this or like that as you go through stuff. So here, here is what we're going to look at as we do that. Let me, let me switch this around because I think the lighting and everything is a little bit better on this other side. And then maybe like that. Okay. All right. You guys can see everything well? All right. So, um, the first thing that I want to do is I am going to sight down the blade this way. So I'm going to hold it just below my eye level a little bit, and I'm going to lower the handle relative to the tips. The tips just a little bit up. So as I'm looking at stuff, you can see it's me looking like this. And I'm going to first look here, and I'm going to move the way that I look all the way down the blade. And I want to make sure that it's straight. And I can even lift up a little bit as I do that. So I'm checking first the spine. And I want to see, is it bent this way? Is it bent that way? Uh, and if I see a bend, I want to figure out where the bend begins, where the bend ends, and where the apex of the bend is. So where it's most bent. All right, so checking like this. Then I flip over the knife, and I do the exact same thing with the edge facing up, looking again, starting here, and slowly lifting up to see how straight it is. So one, two. Now I want to flip it around so that the edge is facing towards me and do the same thing, looking at the edge, checking for straightness, and then looking at the spine checking for straightness. And I'll usually close one eye when I do it just to, to get a better sense of what's going on. All right, after that, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna hold it vertically like this. And in the background, I wanna make sure that I have some kind of vertical line that I can see. So whether that's like the corner of a wall or like a door frame or just something that's like, you know, generally straight vertically. And what I'll do is I'll line my knife up with that as I look 
and I'm going to look and see is the spine straight and also is it coming out of the handle straight like for example did the blade enter the handle perfectly or is it just tilted off to the side like this or like this all right and I'm going to do that first of the spine and then I'm going to rotate it with the edge facing towards me and do the same thing when I was looking at it this way like like this I can also see was it installed in the handle uh straight on so like for example uh, is this vertical or is it tilted off to the side like this? Because sometimes they get installed incorrectly that way. So again, we have one, two, three, four, five, six. And now we're going to look for warping. And so the way that we're going to look for warping is I'm going to hold the knife up like this, relatively eye level, and I'm going to look at the edge. And then I'm going to look at the space behind the edge and I'm going to see, is the edge straight here? Or do I see that it's kind of twisting or warping in any way? So I'm going to look like this. And then as ridiculous as it sounds, I'm going to look the exact same way, just with the handle facing the other way. And then I'm going to do the same thing with the spine on one side and then the other side. And so those are the ways that I'm going to assess straightness uh, and, and all that kind of stuff. And if I see problems, I want to fix them. Um, it's going to take time to develop your eyes to, to be able to see those things. Like I know when I spend time with uh, one of my sharpening masters, uh, you know, he's, he's much older than I am and his eyes are in way worse condition. He still sees way more of this shit than I do, you know? So we'll, we'll be looking at something together and I don't see anything. And he'd be like, well, you don't see this. It'll point like directly to the, the problem, like pointing to, it, and I still don't see it. And then, you know, like the next year I'll come back and it will be the, and I'll see that one. Cause I've spent like a year looking for that problem. Um, so it, it does take some time to develop your eyes in, in that way, um, for fixing straightness. Uh, for bends, not for warping, for bends. One of the tools that we use is this big wooden stick. Uh, it's got this little kind of cross section over here and a thicker piece over here. You can make stuff like this out of like a little two by four with notches. Um, this, is, this is what we use. And so what we do is when we figure out where a bend is, it's so like say there's a bend that starts here and ends here and the apex is here. What we're gonna do is we're gonna work in the opposite direction, starting at the base of where that bend is and applying light pressure in the opposite direction and increasing our pressure until we get to the apex of the edge, uh, the apex of the bend, and then decreasing pressure as we move away from it. Uh, and we wanna do that lightly, bit by bit. It's possible to snap blades. If you're too close to the tip, it's possible to snap the tip off. Uh, and so that's, that's how we would be fixing blade straightness like that. This big notch over here, we use for correcting how the blade was installed in terms of this way. So if the blade is straight, but it's installed in the handle this way, we can fix that using this piece here, applying pressure this way or this way, depending on how we want to do things. So that's that's how we would fix blade straightness using something like this. We can do things like this with a hammer as well. It's just a riskier thing that requires refinishing uh, when you're done. Uh, in the same way that fixing any kind of warping requires refinishing when you're done. And so for warping, generally we use like a chiseled hammer, uh, sometimes with tugs in carbide bits at the end of it. Uh, and when you, hammer in with the chisel, it spreads the metal out. So like if I hammer this way, the blade will start to bend this way. Um, and so I can look at warps and I can hammer diagonally to fix those warps as I do stuff, but it does create markings or gouges in the blade that then need to be refinished afterwards. Uh, so the warping is a pain in the butt is the, the main point of it. Uh, but you do ideally always wanna be checking blade straightness uh, before you start. And if it's not straight or you're not sure, bug me. Ask me questions, send me pictures, bring the stuff in when this whole thing is over. Please don't bring stuff in now. Uh, <laughs> um, I, you know, I'm, I'm happy to help out with that kind of stuff whenever I can. Just know that it might not always be possible for you on your own to fix that kind of stuff. And it might not always be possible to fix those things in general, but quite a bit of it is uh, manageable. Quite a bit of it can be repaired. Um, all right, so hopefully that answers that with respect to blade straightness. All right. Um, blah, blah, blah. I'm just trying to skip over things. What are the benefits, if any, to using a Funayuki Deba? What do they excel at? Funayuki are confusing. So traditionally, Funayuki are single bevel knives that are very thin Deba. Uh, they can be used on, I mean, the, the history of them is that they were brought on boats with uh, fishermen uh, and they were used to prepare all kinds of things. But they generally got used on softer, less potentially damaging things. So like mackerel, anchovies, sardines, a lot of the bluefish like that, but not so much on snapper or rockfish or grouper where the, the bones are extremely hard because it tends to chip. Um, 
those are the single bevel Funayuki. They're also double bevel Funayuki from areas like Kochi or, uh, you know, like random not major knife making areas where they make a lot of double bevel knives with the names of single bevel knives, like Yanagiba, Zasujihiki, you know, that kind of stuff. Um, and they're used kind of the same way, uh, but they can also sometimes be chef knife like, even though it's not necessarily what they were intended to be. Um, and then now in the US, uh, people refer to Funayuki as a specific shape of a Gyuto. Um, I don't hear that in Japan ever, really, except when people are talking about how people view things in the US. Mm -hmm. uh, it's, I guess just because the shape was the same, kind of in the way that people say like Kiritsuke, but what they really mean is Kiritsuke shaped Wagyuto because Kiritsuke refers to a very specific single bevel knife. They're not the same, they don't function the same, they just have like the same profile. Um, so, uh, the, the answer is the more delicate fish like mackerel, anchovies, stuff like that, but they can be used as all-purpose knives. Uh, and if you're talking about like a Funayuki shaped Gyuto, then it's just a chef's knife that has that kind of shape to it. Um, any idea when I might be restocking the Ginga line? I have all that stuff on order. I had to ask all of the people that we work with to hold off on shipping us stuff for a little bit. So I think shipments will be resuming in May just because we had to shut down for a little bit. I plan to get around to starting to pack up orders and stuff again since it's been about two weeks that I've been isolated uh, and I'm symptom free. So I feel comfortable coming back into work on my own to start on that stuff. So hopefully soon. How do I keep my hands so clean when I have mud, blah, blah, blah. Uh, I wash my hands a lot. I have soap that has pumice in it that I, I clean stuff off with. But the reality is my hands almost always have like metal embedded in them. And they always have like some some black on them, no matter no matter what I do. Uh, but generally like pumice based soaps tend to help out a lot and washing my hands frequently. I can't use gloves when I sharpen. They get stuck underneath the knife. It's really dangerous. It, I can't feel what's going on. I know some people do that. I've never been able to do it. It, it doesn't allow me to feel what's going on. Um, what would you recommend for beginner sharpeners, the switch hand method or what they're calling traditional? Um, I don't know, I'd recommend the method you feel most comfortable with. Uh, it's not that one is right and the other is wrong. Uh, just do, do the stuff that feels more comfortable. Try both and see how they work for you. And, and don't just like try it once and then be like, fuck that, I'm done with it. Try them for like a decent period of time. Try and like get decent in them and see how stuff goes and then make a decision about what works best for you. Uh, there's nothing more that I want to instill in people when I teach sharpening than learn how to critically think. And, and problem solve you, you, you know, your own stuff. And the more that you're able to do that, the more that you, you can answer these questions for yourself because you know what's going on. Um, blah, blah, blah. All right, then everyone's answering their own questions. Can you show us how you thin your knives? So a long, long process. And I don't know if everyone else wants to bear with the whole time consuming thing. Also, I don't have a way to put my laptop functionally into my grinding room. I use my water wheel for that stuff because it's faster, but it's literally the same as sharpening just at a much lower angle. And as I'm doing it, I'm constantly, where did I put that knife? Let me just go grab a knife. I'm constantly looking at a couple of things. I wanna make sure that the bevel size is reducing evenly and consistently all the way from the heel to the tip. So that tells me that I'm removing the same amount of metal behind the edge at each place along the blade. And then I'm also looking at the blade like this so that I can see how it tapers from spine to edge. Uh, maybe like there. Uh, so I want to look at that and see how it's tapering as I'm doing stuff. But I'm also going to run my fingers across the edge like this so I can feel stuff. And I'm going to be using that to gauge how much or how little I want to do for, for thinning. If you do that on stones uh, and it happens to be a wide bevel knife, then you can just go through your entire progression to get everything to look nice. If it's not a wide bevel knife, there's going to be scratches all over the side of the blade. So you can use sandpaper uh, or a belt grinder if you have one. To, to refinish it and make it look pretty. And you can even do convex grinds that way if you want. Um, I, I think I have some like live streams where I've done that kind of stuff before. Uh, and I certainly have work that I have to do like that. So maybe at some point I'll do like a little YouTube live stream and show you guys that whole process. Uh, I have the Geshen 1000, 6000 combo stone. Should I leave it soaked 24 seven or wrapped in a damp towel? It's a ceramic stone. You can soak it permanently. You can dry it out if you want. Uh, it's not gonna get messed up from soaking or drying. You don't have to wrap it in a damp towel at all. Uh, that's more a function of resinoid based stones. Um, if you do dry it out, just know that the stones take a lot longer to dry than people think. So if you dry it and put it back in the box, it's probably still got some water in it and the box is really likely to soften up and mold and get all disgusting. Uh, so just don't put it back in the box uh, when, when you're drying stuff out. If you can leave it in a well-ventilated area, that's the best. 
Um, cool. Uh, so that should take care of that. Good thing to know about the sweep. I was curious if the tip naturally came like that or if I messed up the Uraoshi. Um, hold on. Uh, I see the knives there, but I am going to stop the screen sharing. Give me a second. All right, thank you. Thank you for that, because I didn't know how to do that right away. Um, yeah, so sometimes the, the tips do come like that naturally. You do want to look and make sure that the edge is straight. That's the most important thing, and there's not like any kind of warping or anything like that. Um, but no, it's, it's not uncommon for you to have to lift up the handle a little bit, not a lot, a little bit uh, for the backs of single bevel knives when you do them near the tip. Uh, it should not be a huge amount. It should be very little. Uh, and if you're curious, send me an email with pictures and we can see what's up and see if I can help you out with that. Uh, for those with single bevels, can you go into a little bit more detail about the value of beta togi versus hamaguri? Uh, beta togi is a, a on onomatopoeia. Beta is like the onomatopoeia for something lying flat on something else. Uh, so the idea behind beta togi is that with your bevel, you just lie it flat on the stone and you sharpen it. It creates a flat ground bevel. Flat ground bevels are certainly easy in the sense that you don't have to do multiple steps to get it to, to work well for you. Um, and they're a little bit sharper feeling because it's a little bit more acute directly at the edge, but they also happen to be a little bit more brittle. Uh, and they do tend to also have food stick to them a little bit more. Uh, Hamaguri edges are a little bit thicker directly behind the edge. So they don't feel quite as crisp, but uh, they have better food release and they're less uh, fragile or brittle, which can be helpful. Uh, but what's most important about the Hamaguri edge is they give you independent control over the Shinogi line and the edge. With Betatogi, if there's an issue with your Shinogi line, it will manifest itself in the edge because they're intrinsically connected. Uh, if there's an issue with your edge, it will manifest itself with the Shinogi line. And so that exacerbates issues with like warping, bending, uh, poor grinding in the, the upper section of the knife, all that kind of stuff. So um, Hamaguri tends to be my preference in the sense that it provides a very good edge, better food release, better toughness and durability and independent control of the Shinogi line and uh, edge. Uh, but beta togi is, is okay if you wanna do that. It does tend to require a micro bevel more often than not in the case of single bevel knives because of how thin the edge ends up being and because of how brittle it can be because of that. Um, so hopefully that works. Uh, will this be uploaded to my YouTube channel? I think we're live streaming the whole thing right now. So it should all be uploaded and saved on there, uh, but I will double check that later. On a convex blade, there may be high and low spots. Is the sandpaper regression uh, and then finger stones or mud the way to get a nicer refinish? Finger stones and mud can be really, really tricky. And it's very important that when you do that, you have a really good base or foundation of grinding so that it looks nice. Sandpaper is probably the easiest way to, to do it. Uh, not, and it's not easy, it's time consuming, but it's pretty straightforward. Uh, I, again, I use a belt grinder because it's faster and easier, but yes, you can do it that way. Um, ba, ba, ba. all right. Uh, what would be a step up in quality from a King 1000 grit stone? Um, man, you got, you should just try out some different stones if you can. There are a lot of things that are out there that people would say are objectively nicer. I don't agree with the objective view on that. For many people, a King stone is a great stone. Uh, it's, it's like the Honda Civic of, of sharpening stones, right? Like it gets you from point A to point B, but no one ever is like, Ooh, I really want one but it's good, it lasts for a long time. It does what it's supposed to do. And what I like about it is that it forces people to focus on skill and technique and not buying fancy shit to cover up poor skill and technique. Um, in terms of what would be a step up in quality, it depends on what you like. Do you want something softer, harder? Do you want faster cutting, less muddy, more muddy? So there's a lot that goes into that. And if you wanna shoot me an email uh, anytime about that, uh, I, can, I can walk through kind of a, a series of questions and give you some ideas of, of what options might make sense. Um, it just depends on what you like. It's not that there's an objective better or worse in this case. Uh, could you elaborate on the care and maintenance of carbon steel knives? Absolutely. So uh, with carbon steel knives, there are two things that you wanna be worried about, rust and reactivity with acidic foods or oxidization. Rust is really straightforward. When the knife is not in your hand cutting stuff, it's clean and dry. So you always have a dry towel and a damp towel nearby, wipe it clean, then make sure it's completely dry and put it down so it's totally dry. If you're gonna store it for an extended period of time, more than like a couple of days, you might wanna give it a light coating of mineral oil or camellia oil, uh, which will help prevent moisture from settling on the blade and, and therefore prevent oxidization. If you're gonna store it for a longer period of time, I highly recommend uh, Renaissance wax. Um, 
it's not food safe. So you definitely want to clean your knife off when you're done with it, but it's just a more kind of stable way of keeping your knife from, from rusting or picking up fingerprints, water spots, whatever, uh, while it's being stored. Um, the trickier thing with carbon steel knives is how you work with them, uh, especially around acidic foods. So as a right-handed user, I have a damp towel in the lower right-hand corner of my board. And as I'm cutting stuff, cut, 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 wipe, wipe, cut, 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 wipe, wipe. The more acidic the food is, the more often I'm wiping off the sides of the blade because I want to build up or I want to mitigate the buildup of acidic food on the blade so I can manage how reactive things are being. When carbon steel knives react with acidity, you get color, taste, and smell changes. Food, things will turn brown or black and start to taste and smell metallic and your knife will patina, which is a color change, uh, and may also smell a little bit metallic. Uh, and so we can mitigate that by wiping off a little bit more frequently. If you're using your food right away, cool, no stress. If you're gonna use it later on, it's like say you're gonna make French onion soup, so you cut a shit ton of onions uh, and then you're gonna get to the soup in a little bit, you may wanna rinse those things off and put them back into a hotel pan or whatever container so you can mitigate uh, that oxidiz oxidization from continuing in the time that you're waiting. So like if you're prepping out all your stuff in like hotel pans for service, uh, consider how acidic the food is and when you cut it and when you're planning to use it. Um, and then in terms of managing patina, if you don't mind the way patina looks, you can let it develop naturally. Uh, and the more the patina sets in, the less reactive the knife will be. Uh, but of course it looks a little bit dirty. Uh, if you don't like the way patina looks, like myself, uh, you will constantly be polishing that stuff off. And uh, initially, I used to use rust erasers for that. Uh, in Japan, people use like a little round of daikon and a non-bleach powder cleanser, like think uh, Bonami, uh, not Ajax or Comet or anything like that because it has bleach in it. Uh, but they take that and they dip it and they scrub it on the blade, but it's abrasive. So you see scratches in the same way that you would see scratches from rust erasers. So lately, what I've been doing is using uh, semi-chrome, uh, which is a type of metal polish. They sell small jars of it also, so you don't have to get our tubes. Um, and I use the little cotton pad. You could do that with flits, something like that. You just get a little bit and, and rub it in there until all the patina is gone and wipe it off and clean off your knife because it's, again, a chemical. Um, that should take care of light patina and light rust. If you're seeing heavier set in or heavier rust or patina, something like that, uh, you may need to use something more abrasive like a rust eraser or like sandpaper. Uh, that kind of stuff. Barkeeper's Friend is not my favorite because it uh, uses oxalic acid, which actually further causes patination of the blade. So you'll see patinas develop from that kind of stuff, uh, but it does do a good job at getting rid of rust. So if you have deeply set in rust, you can use that to get rid of the rust and then clean the blade off when you're done with it. And I think that that covers all of the carbon steel stuff. Um, do you have any new knives brands coming in the near future? Yeah, a ton of stuff. Uh, it's just going to take time for me to get back up and running again. I have a bunch of orders to fill and but yes, there's like a really sick white number one series that I'm very excited for and a whole bunch of other stuff that we have going on. Um, all right, my medium grit stone is a Geshen 2000. Compared to my two other stones, I would say I get little to no tactile feedback from it and can work up very little mud. Any tips on getting better performance from it? That's odd. Usually I have really good tactile feedback from it. Uh, what are the other two stones that you use if you have a second to answer that? Um, yeah, uh, let me... Un Geshen you there? 400 and 6,000. Which, the 6,000 or 6,000S? 6, mm, uh, not sure. Was it in the stone set? I think, yeah. Okay, cool. So that's the 6,000S. So the 400 is going to have better tactile feedback no matter what. Uh, it's a coarser stone. It's softer. It releases more fresh abrasive. Uh, and the 6,000 is also a relatively soft and muddy stone. Um, I guess I would say flatten the 2,000 with a coarser flattening device. Uh, that should help out in terms of tactile feedback, at least in the beginning of your sharpening process. Uh, a lot of water uh, helps out and sometimes slightly heavier pressure on that stone can also help out. Not like bear down on it with, you know, 10 pounds of pressure, uh, but maybe get like a little bit closer to the 1500, 2000 gram range of things. Um, but adding, adding water frequently helps out. And then it depends on what, what you're sharpening. Harder steels will feel more skittish on that kind of in general. Um, you, and you may find that you just like other other kinds of stones a little bit more. So like the 400 is much softer. The 6,000 is much softer. The 2,000 is the hardest of that group. So maybe you enjoy softer stones and that will work better for you. Um, yeah. But in, in terms of improving it, what you can do, flatten it with a coarser thing. By scratching up the stone surface, uh, you do a number of things. One, you improve tactile feedback. You can feel what's going on a little bit more. Two, uh, by creating all those little grooves and valleys and scratches from the, the coarse flattening, you get much more exposed surface area. So more fresh abrasive gets released more quickly. So the stone cuts a little bit more quickly. 
and it holds water on the surface a little bit better. But it's a temporary thing because as soon as you continue to sharpen on it, uh, all those uh, scratches go away. Uh, but you can do that, you know, periodically to to refresh stuff. And that does not work on natural stones uh, in the same way. So that would just be for synthetic stones. Um, and then yes, uh, the polish was called semi-chrome. Someone put a link in there. Look, I think we got to uh, to all the questions. Uh, unless there's anything else that you guys have, uh, I'm gonna let you guys get on with your day. I really appreciate you all taking time to to hang out and, and watch this. And I hope you guys are all staying safe and, and healthy. And Ryan, man, really, thank you so much for for all of your help. A in, in prompting this whole thing to happen, and and B in just logistically making this stuff happen today. Uh, really, really appreciate it. Uh, look forward to having a beer with you when this stuff is all done. Um, yeah. Thank you guys so much. Uh, I guess I'm going to end this chat now, uh, but just want to say I really appreciate you guys coming out and hanging out for a little bit. So have a great day. Stay safe and healthy, and we'll see you guys on the flip side. Yeah, thanks, everyone.